driven decisions uh, for their company. So take it away, guys. Great. So um, data is a really important part um, when you're trying to develop your marketing and sales uh, strategy. Um, and it's also really fundamental if you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I develop my product as well? So really fortunate to have these three teams here because they're all in that space. So what I wanted to do is maybe just open it up, maybe a boss if you can start and give us an idea of what you do, what the company does, and how you play in that space. Yeah, so CrowdBabble, we're a social media analytics platform. Uh, we basically help marketers uh, to do three things. Uh, one is measure social media, two is to benchmark against competitors, and three is to optimize their own social media performance. Um, and basically, uh, we're an analytics company, right? So we're all about data, uh, and everything we do is based off of data. Uh, we, we, you know, there's a saying, data don't lie. So, you know, in the previous talk, uh, there was some discussion around, hey, I have a good idea, or hey, I, I have a, you know, a new feature that I want to add to CrowdBabble. But what we do is, we don't make any assumptions. We literally run an experiment for anything that we want to do, whether it's acquiring new customers or improving their experience with our platform. Everything is based on experimentation and learning from that data. Justin? Um, so uh, from Freightnet, uh, we are a um, SaaS-based platform uh, transportation management software for uh, manufacturers and distributors. Uh, so in, in our space, it's a little bit it's a little bit different. We use a, our customers are fairly um, non-technically inclined. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a different animal for how we use data. Um, right now, probably I'd say the most applicable uh, way we use it is in our marketing. So we're really trying to figure out um, who is signing onto our site uh, from what messaging um, and what kind of behaviors they're, they're doing once they reach our site or our application. As we move to more of a self-onboarding platform, uh, it's really imperative uh, for our business to understand user behaviors through the onboarding life cycle. And again, using a, a baseline of a pretty um, low level technical uh, user base, um, it's, we have to be pretty uh, pretty articulate in how we how we look at that data. It, it can be um, a lot of red herrings. I think you could probably you know, attest to that. But you have to be very careful. I want to sort of preface that that is extraordinarily important, but you can also get some paralysis from it. You can get very deep inside it, and I would just I would caution uh, uh, if you know the space that you're in. I think you know, instinct will also also uh, be, be a good thing. Yeah, so uh, I'm from Steadfast Beta. We are a user research company. We help other companies figure out what the customers want. Uh, the way we do that is we like to describe this sort of like Slack for talking to users. So it's like a messaging application where you can upload your prototypes and designs and that kind of stuff and get feedback on them. And then we analyze all the feedback you get. We benchmark against demographic information, whatever we know about users. Um, so we actually we use our own product to gather data. Uh, so when it comes to making interface decisions, we use the steadfast beta platform to ask our users, you know, what they what they like and don't like about it, uh, and we share with them different ideas we have for interface improvements and things like that. So uh, we actually work really hard to try and be in, in, in cahoots and in communication with our users at all time because we're only successful if they truly love the product and really engage with it. So we're we're really focused on that. Sometimes we pick up the phone too and call them up. And Again, just sometimes you track it with the paper, but, um, but yeah, you talk to the users a lot. Great. Okay. So um, in the startup world, it's, it's kind of challenging because, you know, um, there's information everywhere. How do you distill this information? How do you look at, there's like the numbers and then there's the right numbers. So how do you uh, use this data to really drive decisions with your, say, marketing strategy? How do you acquire customers? So I'm just gonna turn it over to, let's say Justin, why don't you start? Um, how, do you, how do you use data to make decisions about acquiring customers? What customers to go after? You know, how do they, how do they segment? Yeah, so usage for us would be, um, uh, our, ours is a platform that you use every day, it's a business critical tool. So somebody who is uh, shipping freight every day will be putting orders through the system. So for us, if we start seeing um, fall offs of, of usage, um, if we start seeing, uh, or on the flip side, more users being added to the platform, so a particular company is adding uh, more users and we have three new people inside that company using the product, um, we know adoption is, is increasing versus 
less shipments uh, every day, a complete fall off in the product. Uh, we know we know traction is, is falling off at that point. So measuring traction and usage for us is a uh, um, we analyze it weekly, but it's really uh, measured measured daily. Um, and Abbas, how do you approach that? Yeah, customer acquisition is huge for us, um, and, and depending on which stage we've been in our business, we're a startup, so things change. So there's been different uh, ways of acquiring customers. So what we do right now is we have traffic coming to our site from Facebook, from, from Google, from our email blasts, from all over the web, and we basically want to know which traffic is the best for, for our company. In other words, which traffic sends us paying customers. So even though we get a lot of people coming from Facebook, they don't really pay as much as people from Google come, uh, come to our site. So what's important for us is tracking all the visitors that are coming, where they're coming from, how much they're actually spending on our platform. Are, are they subscribing or are they just using our free trial and bouncing? So that informs us which channels are good for us and then we put more attention, more focus, and more money towards those channels that work. So are, just a, another question there. So are there any metrics, specific metrics, that are more important than others? Like, you know, everybody looks at yep. Google Analytics, let's yep, say. Sure. What are the ones that you really track and make an impact on how you're acquiring customers? Yep. So that was like 1.0. Yeah. Let's just get users, let's get them paying. Right. Number two is then, how do we get more of these high quality users? And that's where we go deeper and start dissecting our data at another level. So. What we did recently is we're trying to figure out what are the triggers that people take before they pay. So once we see, hey, we have a new paid user, we, we go back and we see everything that paid users done. The first day they logged in, they invited a team member. The second day, they generated a PDF report. And we identified all these triggers, and those were two of the main triggers that result in people paying, is inviting team members and exporting a PDF file. So now we drive all our users to do those actions, and that increase our conversions. That's great. So the next question I have is around product development. And Alec, you're in that space. Um, how do you recommend or use yourself data to help <coughs> shape the product that you are putting in the market? So, so before we, we think about building anything, um, we really try and uh, develop a theory for, for why we should build it. Um, what's the need? Who needs it? Why? How does it need to work? All that sort of stuff. And before you know, I, before any of our developers or, or design team touches anything, we, we go and we try and validate that. So sometimes that's a little bit more scaled methods, like um, you know, using our own, our own product, for example, to get to get that sort of feedback. Or yes, you know, I don't like this about your product. It'd be great if you could improve it, right? And then we'll say, okay, so part of that theory is validated because you know, 80% of users said that you know this was a big issue. Um, and sometimes when we have these theories, they, they prove to be wrong, where, or, or that, uh, or in some cases where we're sort of right, but, but we need to do some more digging because we don't have the full picture. So uh, the, way we, the way we sort of approach it is before we make any investment of time or resources into anything related to product, we say, okay, how can we make sure that this is a really well-educated guess and, and validate it as much as possible before moving to the next stage? So have a design idea, we'll go and put that in front of users before we go invest the coding resources into actually building it. Um, and before we go and launch it, where we're now you have something live and the old thing is gone, let's make sure we put that through a beta with enough users where we can say, you know, definitively the user experience is better and this is something that people want. So we sort of like have a gated approach where if, if the data talking to users doesn't say that this is better or that this is solving the problem, then it doesn't move any further. And that way we can allocate resources uh, That's great. Okay, so what about the tools, some of the tools that you guys use? Because, I mean, um, I think as a startup, we all have to be you know, really conscientious about spending money, and free tools are always great. So can you give, um, can you give some advice on what are the best tools that you come across to help gather the data for your business? Bus? Yeah, sure. Um so we started using this one tool around the beginning of the year called Mixpanel. So I don't know if anyone's heard of Mixpanel. Uh, it basically allows you to track every event that happens in your app. So when a user invites a team member, you can track that as an event in your app. 
And what you can do is you can look through specific users and, and see everything they've done over their lifetime. But you can also look at the data in aggregate. So you can see that, hey, during the month of September, how many people uh, out of our 2,000 users actually invited their team members? So it, it's pretty interesting that way. Um, it's, it's free up to a certain limit. We're still on the free plan. Um, but I found it a little bit uh, difficult to manage when your app is changing so quickly. So we, we added new features like almost every day. And then we got to go back, add it in the mixed panel. We, we got to test it, make sure everything's working OK. So it's, it's a good place to start. But I just found a tool a couple of weeks ago that literally knocked my socks off uh, called Full Story. And I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It's basically a DVR for your customer experiences. So you can go in and see every single person who's used your, your app or your site and play back their interaction with your site as a video. And you can watch it in like 4x mode, so you can like speed through it. But this really uh, gives you more than just what data provides. It actually shows you where their mouse is going, like click rage if they're clicking on something. So it's, like, it's like being like being a fly on the wall. Like, yeah, basically. And just right? standing over somebody's shoulder yeah. and seeing that's awesome. It's like you're you're yeah. like a, you know an agent, a secret agent, and you yeah. like tapped into someone's computer, so it's pretty cool. But it's it starts at two hundred bucks. Two hundred bucks. Full story. Okay. Yeah. And is that is it two hundred dollars a month or two hundred bucks? Yeah. So, Basic plan is two hundred bucks a month. And then it scales up from there. Yeah. We're on the 200 bucks. That's great. Right. How about you, Justin? Any, any fantastic tools you come across? Yeah, so we use a similar um, similar product. This is, that's a great tool, by the way. That's that's I've never heard of that until this moment. And that's, that's like, we need that exactly right now. It's actually a perfect, perfect place for us. Um, so Intercom uh, is, is a product that we're using. It's a newer company, um, 500 startup company, I think. Really, really cool as far as, again, analyzing customer behavior. For us right now, we're trying to prove a lot of uh, onboarding concepts. So when people are coming into our app and they are signing up, and it's about a four-stage sign-up, um, so we can see them that they've come to the site, but we want to know where they're falling off. So we can iterate back on that and, and try to create some hooks that will bring them further down the, the uh, down the stream into the product. We know once they get into the product, we've seen from uh, user behavior that's fairly sticky ones inside. But we're struggling right now trying to get them from finding us on, say, an AdWords campaign, clicking on a on a, on a landing page, and going through the onboarding. Up. So we're trying to move people through the offering, and intercom has been, been really critical to, to that. Um, there's a, a it also integrates into your application. So this is where you'll do uh, internal messaging. So it's a, hey, it's Justin from Freightnex, how are you? And you can speak in, inside the application too. So it doubles as a, as a couple other products, but really beautiful as far as uh, uh, usability. Super super simple um, and really insightful to again user behaviors. Um, and then the final piece would be throwing this one on on the end to see what they're actually doing. That's that's a yeah, I, I'm definitely uh, impressed with, with Intercom as well. Um, I, I just I love talk, like, talking to users as an idea, like actually having a conversation with people and Intercom to do that, uh, which I think is fantastic. Uh, the other thing that I, I personally like is a company called Keep Analytics. Uh, and the reason I like them is because uh, I'm not very technical. Anything I've ever built has been burned and thrown out by my co-founders. Um, for the better. Uh, but one of the things that it lets me do, you, you put in like one tag on, on the web page, and then uh, they have this mode where you can, you can, oh, and it's free up to like 5,000 users or something. Uh, and you can go and turn on this mode and like walk through your site and click on like buttons and links and whatever. And just say, okay, I want this to be tracked and I want this to be tracked. So you don't have to be technical, and you can just quickly say, okay, here, here are where all my tags are going to be, and then it starts tracking them for you. So, um, no, no, you don't have to mess around with any JavaScript or anything like that. You can just go and just start tagging stuff. And so I guess I'll just open it up to the audience as well. Anybody else can share any useful tools that they've come across um, that are you know, particularly good in one area, be it acquiring customers, retaining customers, or um, helping you decide what product features to build? No? Yes. Do any of you um, use surveys and how do you use them? Because it's more of a passive um, way of taking data from surveys and more Sure. Uh, we, we did a, a stab at surveys and actually interviewing our users over Skype. Uh, but what we found was we're kind of guiding them through the process. So I don't know how organic the, the responses were. 
Um, and we don't do that anymore. So we still do the one-on-one -on -one Skype kind of chats just to you know, learn from our users. But the data actually, and the whole story, which I mentioned early, earlier, really shows us what our users are doing. So we kind of grew away from that. I don't know if you guys do surveys. Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, like a survey and content is a good way to sort of get at scale like, to people's heads and understand what they're thinking. There's a lot of problems with surveys, uh, mostly that people don't do them. Um, you know, like I, I, I read an article somewhere, it's like some guy was complaining he only got a 2% response rate, so he was like talking to one of his colleagues, he was like, you got a 2% response rate? That's amazing. Right? And, and like imagine you're, you're trying to like, you know, make hundreds of thousands of dollars of like product investments and you're, you're doing it on only 2% of people having responded. Like think about all the bias that that, you know, maybe only people that hate you are responding to people who only use this feature or that feature or whatever. Um, I think that part of the reason that we don't do surveys is, uh, I think the biggest part is that they just don't have a personal connection with you. So I think that it's, it, you can, surveys can be effective. Typically the user experience on the mistakes. Uh, so if you use something like a type form, they have like a really beautiful user experience for a survey and so that, that can solve that problem. But even still, you, you need to actually, like the person needs to know you need to build a relationship with them if you expect them to, to sort of talk with so, them. I think it comes back to the whole idea of like talking to users and building relationships with them. Um, and it sort of plays into the product that we're building a little bit. So we have a survey tool sort of built into what we're doing. And because you've built a relationship with these people over time, and they know what you're trying to do with them. Not only are their responses more insightful, um, but you can also get high enough response rates. And, and that's, so, so it can be useful. I just think that most of the survey tools in the market are, are not. So what is that? So I just want to add, there are like certain scenarios where surveys could make sense. Like if someone, what we're thinking of implementing is when someone cancels their account, just a quick survey pops up like, hey, why did you cancel? In those kind of instances, uh, I've seen higher response rates, which may make sense for you depending on what whatever your startup is. I think I think a difficulty not to, but I think a difficulty with the survey as well is trying to get the right question and giving the right answers. Like you have to be pretty good, I think, at asking questions. It's almost like it would be tricky how you're going to extract it. So, so if you ask, hey, why did you leave? Well, we didn't like the product. Well, what am I going to do with that? You know, I, I don't even know not to say there's a value there, but I think it's, it's we would need very quantifiable answers to make a, a quantifiable decision. Oh, I didn't like the way that this went, but if you fix that, I would come back. Okay, that's a cool answer, but I just don't see that as happy unless you structure it in a certain way. That brings up a good point, because even with surveys, I think there's got to be some kind of action plan afterwards. What are you going to do with the information? Yeah, what's the point? Right? Right. What's the point? And I think that's the, the most effective market research that I've seen. You know, you start out with already knowing what you're going to do with the information that you're going to have coming back. And you only ask the questions that you need to have minimum number of questions in order to get the information you need to action on. And I think that's the that's um, any other tips or tricks here in terms of, uh, you know, how, yeah. how do you get that? How do you be the fly on the wall? Like, you yeah. know, this is a great tool that you mentioned, but what about, you know, what about if you're, you know, in a B2B kind of, you're in a B2B business where, you know, you really want to get that feedback from the customer. How do you do that? Yeah, again, it's all about knowing what your objective is. So everything we do has an objective we're trying to achieve. So we're trying to increase the amount of time they spend on a report or on the site or increase the number of people they invite. So you always need to have an objective that you're working towards and then based on that objective, you can identify metrics that tell you whether they're moving towards that objective or not. And then you run your test for a statistically valid period of time, right? Like just five users or 10 users may not be enough. You need a good sample size and you can see if you're moving the needle uh, on your objective. And right. That's how we do it. Um, on the whole issue of tools, like how do you guys filter through all the clutter? I mean, every day there's like thousands more analytic tools, and then there's the most popular ones, and and you reach a certain point where you're thinking, am I using this because it's popular, or am I really getting, you know, yeah, actionable insights? I think this? depending on what type, what, what space you're in, what type of business you're in. I mean, for us, and this goes back to that question. Like, my co-founder right now is at our customer's location today, so we released a new product, and for us to get good testing, we sit with our customers. And so we go into their place, we look what the, we, we see where they sit, we see what, what, a thing we learned very early on when we were pushing our product out is we were gonna build a, um, a fully responsive app, which would make perfect sense, that's how you build apps today. 
we realized that most of our users are still using like Windows 98 computers. So we'd actually change the way our whole product was built. And we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't gone into the customer. So but back to this question is that um, all of this stuff is really, really great and technical and really cool. We can build awesome machines. But if we, if, at the end of the day, we have to, you'll know that the product's working if people are using it, period. And then everything else is just to sort of enhance that and trigger that. But getting that initial first sort of 10 people in the door using the product, that's going to be non-scalable stuff. That's just going to be really going out to the customers, getting to know them, understanding their pain, solving a real world problem. Um, uh, and then after that, you can start tweaking on stuff. You'll know what works for you because each business, all these products have something that's very specific to your type of business. So where we may use the same analytical tool from the surface, there's a feature that works for my business um, versus maybe a boss that we would use different, different things. So I think you cut through the noise when you really understand your product and really understand your customer, things will just things will just seem more clear. It'll just, the, the, all of this stuff, things will just start to kind of go like this and just start to understand where you're going. But I can't, I can't stress enough just to get in front of your customers and understand the real problem that you're solving and not get lost in, in the cloud of tools and automation and scalability and all that bullshit, so. Um, how do you get in front of the first customers? Like, what's your, what's your strategy for, you know, you're starting up this business, you, you know, need to develop the product. How do you find these first customers? I guess it depends where you're, for me, the space that I came from was, you know, I had domain expertise, and I think a lot of good companies are founded from, it was a problem that I was having, or I was in an industry that was solving that problem, and I felt like I could do it better. So I think we already have it, we should have, anyways, a direct connection to the problem or to the customer from day one. Um, and then it's just, for again, for us, I'm a more of an old school guy, so it was just about hustle, which is great. Just going out and literally knocking on the door, making a phone call, just doing the stuff that doesn't scale up anything for me. Yeah, that's interesting. Alex, so what's been your experience in terms of like, you know, I have a problem, I, I'm gonna be my first customer, basically. How do you get to the next one? How do you find the next one and the next one and the next one? Because it's the first few customers that are the hardest to get. Right? Yeah, hard. They're all hard. <laughs> um, I mean, for us, uh, I tried. I tried a lot of different things. Like I tried going to a bunch of events and just talking to everyone I could and just. I mean, one one of the difficulties with that is like you're going to hear no for like months and months and months. And you're going to say like what you're working on is going to be stupid or whatever. Like they don't get it. Usually because you're not communicating it effectively or you don't understand it well enough. It's not it's not usually their problem. It's yours. Um, but I, I did a lot of that, um, and that got us that got us our first couple of customers. I would say just happened happened to work. But we tried other things as well that didn't work. I think that the more useful experience that I've had with this is when I was working at my last company we were building a tool for biomedical researchers and if you it's, it's really not that hard to, to like locate these people they're, they're in the hospitals and the labs and I mean you just you just go there and you, you like offer to buy someone a Starbucks card and they like sit down with you right and like that's we've been I've been doing the Starbucks card thing for, for years and it's like <laughs> it's, it's honestly it's so effective like people will give you like half an hour of their day for a freaking latte <laughs> <laughs> don't give them cash because it doesn't feel good for them you give them a latte they will, they will sit down and like work through your product with you like just every step of the way and that, that brings up a good point guys just because we're in the tech business doesn't mean that every solution has to be tech based because um, there's something really important about relationships and building those relationships with customers and really getting that insight first in order to help inform how your product is moving forward. I think we're getting the hook here, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, um, I think one, one more minute and we'll move on to the next speaker. Any other, sorry? I just want to add to that. So like, another, another good scenario to be in is having customers before you've developed a product, right? And, and what we did with CrowdBow is we just had a landing page, classic lead startup, we just had a landing page with some screenshots. We didn't even build a product yet, and we just started driving traffic. There's sites where you can list your startup for free, or for five bucks, or for 10 bucks. You can buy Google ads, Facebook ads. You can just start driving traffic, and when people go to sign up, you say, hey, sorry, we're, we haven't launched yet, but if you leave us your contact info, we'll, we'll let you know when we do launch. We have like a 1,000 people before we even start that's building great, the product. Yeah, that's a great strategy if you have a B2C business, because B2C businesses are especially hard. To B2B too, I think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't B2B. ever build a product any other, like I would do, no, I would never write a line of code until you've done that. That is, that's an absolute critical, critical starting point. Why spend any money, any time on an idea that's not going to work? That's how you, that's how you validate the market right there. That's, that's perfect. Okay. One last question. 
Um, what uh, role is intuition playing in uh, gathering data? Is there, like, there's a lot of fluid and complex tools, so um, context around every single data point, and do you have a very like, sort of contrarian approach where it's like intuition and data, or do you have a requirement for your data? I think intuition frames your data collection. Like whatever data you want, but if it's not within some sort of theoretical framework for like, you know, here's what the data is being used for, here's what it's validating or falsifying. But it's, you can't, you almost can't have one without the other. Like, you know, if you can collect data about, you know, how many of these chairs are filled, right? Well, it doesn't really do anything for us, right? Um, unless there's like, oh, we want to know how many people showed up today and how we can make things better. You compare this to previous events where we had the same number of chairs or different speakers or something. So, Give an example of what you across. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we uh, at the last time I was at, we launched this new envelope feature, right? And, and um, we, we thought that you know, this was going to be an improvement, right? That, that we were going to be one, and uh, the, the traffic and the conversion rates just dropped to the floor, right? So, like, that data only that conversion rate only exists within the context of, well, we launched something new, right? We have this new gear, new, new feature, whatever it is. And so we use that data to say, oh, maybe this onboarding feature sucks, right? Maybe we shouldn't have that. Or maybe we should turn it back to what it was before, whatever it was, right? But it, the, the data is, is, is the, what you use to falsify or validate or, or, or whatever it is you're building. I would say to that, that there's sort of two components. If you're like inventing something, like truly bringing up something that is nobody's ever seen it, then I think intuition is going to play a huge role in that because you have to deliver that and you have to know what the end user or potential customers are going to want before they do. They don't know what they don't know. But if you're innovating, if you, which is mostly everything, it's, you know, new inventions are, are far and few between. But if you're innovating, then I think you want to use more data because you can say, well, do you like this better than that? And that's the innovation that's the moving forward. So I think it's, I think that that question is fairly broad and I think it really that's where I would start in that. If it's an invention or an innovation, I think that's, Innovation would lend itself to more and more data. And that's how I would do it. There's no, I don't know if that's the right answer. And just to add, like data quality is never 100%. There's always some gaps or issues. So I use something called the smell test. Like if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. And we had a good example today. We're trying to optimize our reports to generate in the fastest possible time. And we're looking at the logs, it's like 0.1 seconds, 0.8 seconds. And then all of a sudden there was like this huge number that was like 400 years. And you're like, that's wrong, right? I mean, there's something's going wrong somewhere, so it didn't pass the smell test. That's, you that's a good point. To... Look for the outliers, too. Yeah, right? look that's, for the outliers. It's always important, you know. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, guys, well, please give a big round of applause for the <laughs> So, my name is Peter, uh, and here is a little bit of my background. I'm uh, just going to cherry pick a couple of different things. My background is in, is in agile software development. So really the, the, the segue there to, to lean, you, you may or may not understand, uh, it really, for me, comes from agile software development. My background is as a geek, uh, so software developer. Uh, and from a startup perspective, um, I work with startups as a service provider mostly, although I do have entrepreneurship background, but that's not been my more recent past. Uh, so, I've been a, uh, a judge and a judge selector, I guess, as well as a mentor at the startup machine. So a lot of the principles that you guys are going to hear about today uh, fit nicely into Lean Startup Machine. And I've also got some VC experience. I've, I've done some consulting with a, with a fund uh, here in Toronto that I believe is still in uh, capital raise mode, which is why that says past investment committee now. <coughs> All right. Just a, a question for you guys. Who uh, who has a company that they have started already? So right now has a company. Okay, great. Who's got an idea that they would love to turn into a company? All right, about half and half. So interesting. So the, so really the, the, the context for those of you who have a company already would be along the lines of what the panel was talking about right at the end. And that is, I'm going to launch a new feature. Does anyone actually really care? Will anyone actually really consume it? Will I make any money on it? For those of you who've got an idea, this is all about, is anyone gonna care about the core idea? 
you, you can really, it's, it's really the, the latter more than the former, but you can really apply it to, uh, to launching a new feature as well. Um, so in terms of lean startup, who's got the lean startup experience? Who's used the methodology before? Any of you guys? Okay. Understand, but not used. Okay, well, which, 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 what is it in the last five projects? You're going to get a super, super quick level set, just so I can use some of the terminology, but that's it. So really intended to be right across the top. Uh, this is what the, the, what the method is meant to do. These are the milestones. So <clears throat> starting from the start with the grandfather of it all, uh, Steve Blank, um, who's uh, now a prof at, uh, at Stanford, and really came up with the whole uh, customer discovery process. I'm sure you guys know that. And he said, your startup is essentially an organization built to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. So really, that is has nothing to do with being an actual company. So a startup isn't some small version of a big company. That is absolutely not what it's for. It's almost, in essence, throwaway which is why we're going to get into minimum viable product in a second, and the, the, the nature of its, uh, well, its purpose and why it's throwaway. <coughs> so Lean Startup, really, at, again, at a really, really high level, goes through three different phases. First one is, do I have a problem that anyone actually has that is worth solving? So there's are really two, two, different, uh, two different answers you're going to get. Worth solving means, is it viable? Can I even make any money off of this? And the first one is, does anyone actually really care? Does anyone really have that pain? And I, and I think I heard one of the speakers talk about that, that notion of pain. So from that, what you tend to do is construct a minimum viable product. That's what MVP is, as I'm sure you guys know. Next phase is, let's actually measure usage of that MVP. And you've heard these guys talk, and obviously they've got existing products, but they're, that, that's actually a lot of the tools that are out there. So making the assumption that this is manifesting in some kind of tech web interfaced product, um, they're gathering metrics on that MVP. That's what this means. Once you gather those metrics, you understand whether you've got traction or not. From there, once you have that traction, if I had a ridiculous hockey stick graph here, we would be at an inflection point so let's say that's revenue and this is time, we'd be at this inflection point and we'd be able to scale, which means every dollar that we add here multiplies by whatever, 10 times, let's just say. That's really where investors want to invest, is where you're at that inflection point, where they can add dollars and you can scale and, uh, and, and, and get that, that multiplier. Uh, so why would you even use this stuff? What is the point of it? It's, it's really a, a risk mitigation method at the end of the day. It's intended to take the luck out of the equation. There is absolutely nothing stopping from you guys who have ideas or you guys who want to launch new features to just really, really, really believe in your baby and go for it. You can do that. But what this is intended to do is to, is to de-risk at the end of the day. So why do you want to do that? Really, for me, it's so that you can stop wasting your human capital. You could have worked on something else, really, if you had validated it. Um, and for me, this Drucker quote really sums it up. There really is nothing so useless as doing something efficiently, which I shouldn't have even done in the first place. So how do I actually go about doing this? It takes a whole heck of a lot of discipline to take that luck out of the equation. Absolutely zero shortcuts. I find myself, it's just human nature to want to, um, as someone mentioned silver bullet. It, you, as a human, you want to take the path of least resistance. That's just who we all are. So this is all about discipline, and it's hard work. So what does that discipline look like? And I'm not gonna get into a lot of details here, uh, but really it's about being a startup scientist. It's about formulating hypotheses, and it's, and it's about methodically being able to test them. So here's an example. Let's just say that I want to validate that eating 10 Big Macs a day causes weight gain. That's a hypothesis. Can you guys think of any improvement in terms of how to make this hypothesis more testable? So back to, whoops, sorry, that. Quantifiable, negatable, doable, repeatable. How can I make that better? Any guesses? Go ahead, yep. Sure. Yep, anyone else? 
I mean, what if, what if I was, fine, I'm eating 10 Big Macs a day, but what if I'm eating 10 Big Macs a day and four McChickens, or, uh, I don't know, uh, eating eight slices of pizza? So I've got to be a little bit more precise. I could actually invert this and say that it's completely unaffected and try and prove that. So there are all sorts of different ways to set up your hypotheses. All that to say, spend some time thinking about it. You can't just kind of throw a hypothesis out there and, and then start validating it. And I find that there's a bit of an iterative nature to this. So you'll come up with a hypothesis, you'll attempt to create a test for it, you'll begin to test it and realize, mm, no, this, this does not hold water. I've got to say, oops, no pointer, only, let's say, and then create another test for it. Okay, so what we're gonna focus on for the rest of this is really right here. MVP. So am I going to build, am I going to focus my time on something that people actually really want? So how do I, what is the thing that I'm going to build to figure that out? What is the test that I'm going to run based on the hypothesis that I have? <clears throat> so I'm going to give you guys a case study for a startup that I'm working with right now. So um, this, is a, this is someone at the idea stage, so it's myself with the founder. Uh, this founder comes out of the fashion industry, so he's a senior VP at Holtz uh, most recently. Uh, and he came up with an idea that he called Vestia. Unlock the value in your closet. So the theory is, or the product idea is, uh, that we all have lots of items in our, in our closet that sit way at the back that we never use. We may or may not even know they're there. So the theory is, if you could actually uh, understand what all those items are and how they might combine with things that you do wear, you might actually wear them more often. You would therefore unlock the value in some of those items. Now certainly, uh, there's a play to this where, you know, there's a retail side to this, perhaps there's a suggestion mechanism that, that fits in. We're not even there yet in terms of theorizing where this product will go. Certainly on the back end, just from the, the founder's experience, there's a data play here. So if we can figure out a way, so the theory goes, to collect all this data, i.e. some element of clothing in the back of your wardrobe or the front of your wardrobe, simply collecting that data, we would be able to provide a really important mechanism uh, for assortment planners. My wife happens to be one of them. She's a buyer for the bank. Uh, to make decisions about, say, putting sweaters in Thunder Bay versus at Queen Street uh, in Toronto. So that's really the end game for this stuff. So now that you have the picture, I'm going to go into a little bit of the process that we followed to, uh, to, to get to the point of determining what our MVP should be and as minimal as it possibly could be. So the first thing that we did is we tried to figure out what in the world are our assumptions? What, what, are, what are these things that could break this whole business model from what we know about it right now? Um, so has, has anyone used mind mapping as a tool to brainstorm? Yeah, really, really, really useful. So basically what we said is, I don't know if you guys can read this, so right here, one of the questions we had is, how can we get the customer to capture the data? Because at this point in time, that was really the, that was really the, the play, honestly pretty much a Trojan horse to get that data so that we could sell it back to, to retailers and brands. <coughs> Excuse me. So what would make the customer want to capture the data was at the center here. And this was really where we started focusing our first, uh, our first test. So we had all sorts of different ideas. Ability to create outfits, ability to sell unused, unwanted items. Uh, ability to showcase your wardrobe from a social perspective. Um, ability to get trusted or professional outfit advice, let's say from a stylist or something like that. Which of course then spawns a whole other one of these bubbles. What would make the stylist actually want to provide that advice? That's down the road. So we were going to validating this first and then validating the other side of that, uh, of the model. So. One of the things that we decided to do very early on, I, I come from a pseudo stats background, emphasis on the word pseudo. Uh, so what I, what I wanted us to do was to make sure we avoided bias. So before we ran any experiments at all, this is actually a survey that we put out to, to narrow down uh, what we were gonna test. 
item, and you can see this question right here says, to what extent do you care about getting the most out of each item in your work? And we had some options. Then, depending on how you answered there, we asked a second question. This spreadsheet goes down probably about another 40, 50 rows, because it's really the combination of these two questions. Um, and in, within each combination, or depending on how they, if they combined or not, we were setting up how we were going to make the decision ahead of time. So that when the data started rolling in, we were going to protect ourselves from our own bias. Because that happens. The data starts rolling in, it's your baby, and you want it to succeed, therefore you have bias towards it succeeding. This keeps you from doing that. So uh, without, you know, before we even sent the survey out, what we came up with were all these different options for what we would do if we got responses that looked like this. So the actions that we had enumerated were depends on the rest of the answers, pivot, find another problem, persevere. <coughs> I should add one other quick tidbit. We did some, some up here are, are, is our research for, uh, for our total population size. So we took a look at working age population in Canada, because that's where it was going to start, and we eliminated nudism as, um, as you know, out of that population. So obviously you've got to have clothes in order to have them in your wardrobe, and we thought you have to buy them. So that number is 24.5 million, and we basically did just did some some, some basic sample sizing to come up with a confidence interval. And so this is something that you will read in the Lean Startup uh, literature as, uh, I think there are two different schools of thought. One school of thought is no, 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 you can be, don't worry about statistical significance at all. Uh, the other school of thought is I, you really should. I, and, and for me, it depends. It depends on the bet that you're making. So in this particular case, um, this was really early on, and what we were trying to figure out is if this was something we were, gonna, we were going to pursue or not. It was a fairly significant bet that we were making. So because of that, we got a little bit more analytical with our, with our population size. So we said, you know, if we want to be uh, plus or minus 5%, 19 times out of 20, which is all that means. You guys have probably seen that a million times in, in newspaper articles, especially around election time then we need a sample size of 385 on that, pamp on that population size. So we were gonna wait until these answers started rolling in. And what that meant is we could be 19 times out of 20 confident that you know, this was either gonna be 30% or 20%. That's really all that meant. So we played around with that data and used this to avoid our bias. So what we ended up with was based on that information, and based on some other research we had done, we wanted to try and test this thing. What were people actually going to do versus what they were telling us in a survey? Big difference. So has anyone seen the movie Clueless? Clueless, anyone? Clueless? Well then, you'll, yeah, no, don't, don't, yeah, you don't have to bow your head in shame. I've seen it, and unfortunately I've had to watch this scene another 55 times since I, since I started working with this startup, because in essence, this, showed up on Alicia Silverstone, whatever in the world her character name was, showed up on her screen at the start of the movie. So she had this big, massive wardrobe, and these items of clothing had switched back and forth when she just went, you know, either auto dress or dress me. She has all these things categorized. So originally, when uh, Vikash, who's the startup founder, came to me, this was the idea, and the question was, how expensive is it gonna be to build this? I said, okay, fine, uh, I see why you're going that way, but let's first figure out what in the world we need to test and how we're gonna test it. So, if that was an MVP that in my mind was not particularly minimal, what would you guys have done to make that more basic and test the same thing? Any ideas? Anyone? Anyone? No? Not so quickly. What's that? Not so quickly. We All right. about half an hour. Uh, <laughs> Use paper. Who said that? I may have talked to him about this already. No, I don't think I have. But yes, Paul, use paper. So that's exactly what we did. So this this person whose hands you can see, these are pictures from her actual wardrobe. So what we did is, <coughs> excuse me, 
We had her, and this was one of the other assumptions we had validated, we had her with her, she had a friend doing this obviously, with her smartphone, take pictures of her in, don't worry, she's got clothes on under here. Uh, so this is her uh, in like a pair of shorts and a tank top or something like that. And then hang each item of clothing, these are her shoes by the way, uh, hang each item of clothing and take a picture of it from the exact same distance. So what we were trying to validate here is what in the world she would do with every single item of her clothing in front of her. So we ran a couple of different versions through this. The first one was literally dump all her clothes on the table, see what she does. Sit back and watch. Does she categorize them? Does she not categorize them? Does she color code them? Does she, what, you know, we basically just sat back and observed. And different people did different things. And then, depending on how that went, we took them through more specific uh, uh, experiments to validate what we thought would be important versus you know, what they ended up doing. So an interesting thing is, you guys probably can't see this, but this is, this is the, the, I don't know that it's a bias, but there's a tendency that we all have um, when we go minimal, or at least when we present our idea to our end customer, that we feel like we've gotta be perfect. So after convincing this particular founder that this was the right thing to do, to test, he couldn't resist, he, so he cut all these things out, and then laminated them, so you can't actually tell. But these are all laminated, so somehow that made it way more polished with pieces of paper cut out. I, I tried to get him to not do it, but he did it. <clears throat> so why is it that cutting for us, cutting a whole bunch of things out of paper was better than you know coming up with, with some web-manifested uh, um, some web manifestation of the same thing, an actual tool. Well, what ended up happening is, you, I, well, you know this if you, if, you, if you think about it intuitively, if I put a whole bunch of cutouts in front of you, you're not judging it as an interface. You're not saying, oh, that button should be blue instead of green. You're not saying, oh, the screen is, you know, I don't, I don't really like the head, which is pointless to what the value is at the end of the day. Going low fidelity, removes all the judgment out of the equation. It allows your customer to focus on what's actually really important, the value that you're, that you're intending to deliver. Now, that feeds back into the experiment. You may actually find out that your fidelity is not really hitting the mark, so you've gotta take what the feedback you get and potentially iterate and adjust. Obviously, it's pretty quick to get the learning. Your, you know, in this particular case, we were cutting things out of paper, uh, and, and we could literally change the experiment depending on, on, on the reaction. You can't do that, it, or we couldn't have done that if we decided to, to build this as a, as a web app, even if we did it in, say, old salmon or something like that. Can't take it away, fiddle with it, give it back to them. It doesn't really work. Obviously low cost to build, except if you laminate, I don't know why you did that, but he did. Uh, and as I said, it's really easy to, to iterate almost on the spot. Um, and really, it, if, you, if we had started down the path of building this into some kind of web manifestation, it's just human nature to have that kind of shut off options. So whatever interface we would have come up with in the first place, we would have been biased to, to, to keep it that way. Again, just a subconscious human nature thing. So what this allowed us to do is literally keep all manifestations of interface open to us because that wasn't what there's good there will be a time where we where we need to test it but now is not it <clears throat> so really when you think about this kind of low fidelity nature of, of testing of being as minimum as you possibly can and you think about why you don't really want to do it this is it so Kent Beck is actually a uh, an agile software guy and uh, yeah, I mean, as you, as you think about the real reason, it's it's not wanting to know that your that your baby's uh, in essence, um, and that's what keeps us from doing it. So to conclude, uh, Eric Reese pretty much said it best. To me, it's 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 the discipline, it's the rigor of trying to figure out first whether you've got something that people actually want uh, before just throwing it out into the world and you know putting all your efforts into it, 
eating ramen noodles for 98 days straight. That's not what this is about. It's really this boring stuff, this disciplined, process-driven stuff that at the end of the day gets you just that little step closer to succeeding because you're de-risking at the end of the day. So that is it. This is how you get in touch with me, and thank you guys very much. Well, do I have more than one? I'm going to be back later on. Yeah? Uh, I just want to get upset about, I guess, like a um, problem set, I am even going to guess, like, I guess, my transition. Um, a lot of times, I guess, like, how do you separate, like, I guess, like, a uh, painkiller or versus a uh, vitamin? Because I guess a lot of times, like, like before, like, Facebook was MySpace, before uh, Google was Facebook, like, there's always a the need to get fetched. Like, how do you, like, when you talk to someone, like, I'm, I'm going to do this, like, this, like, there's already this, like, how do you, like, solve that, like, painkiller versus vitamin, like, that thing that already exists? I mean, in the context of, of this, uh, and, and I'm just going to contextualize it as trying to MVP something in the most minimal possible way, I mean, the, the pain is the pain at the end of the day. So if you're, and I, this isn't the answer to your question because we have to get down to the root of what it really is, it, to me it's, uh, it, it's all about trying to find it through experimenting with it. So whether Know, whether it's vitamin versus painkiller, I don't know that I really care at the end of the day if you're getting gain versus avoiding pain, who cares? But go and put something in front of your customer that elicits whatever it's going to elicit, then make your decision. So if you've got an idea, I think that's where you, that's where you got to start. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, all right, good. Anyone else? Yep. The new thing, <coughs> the new thing that um, so you know, doing this minimal viable product is paper. It's yep. kind of easy to imagine. And okay. uh, validating the texture and actual interaction using the, for example, screen yeah. uh, app is actually uh, you know, is something that was uh, more with this kind of approach instead of just uh, paper. Because that's something that uh, uh, is needed to be validated. Certainly, I agree with you. And so the question is? The question is, uh, <coughs> uh, like, why, uh, why don't you, you know, uh, because I think that's more crucial. Do you? Yeah. For so a, you're, a, for you're, a, like this. you're a function over form guy. Uh, I, I agree with you, but there's a time for it. So the issue is, if you put form in front of someone, you're going to get, uh, you're going to elicit feedback on form instead of function. If that's what you really want to do, there's a time for that. But to me, at idea stage, that's 100% the, the wrong time. You've got to figure out whether the function that you're delivering is the function that is required at the end of the day. If it isn't, who cares if you've got a beautiful interface on it or a well-designed single-page app? Or I could care less. It's, it's timing. Yeah. For me. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I, I just think it's, uh, it's kind of important. I, I don't disagree with you that it's important, but what I do, where I do disagree with maybe, or maybe we agree, is it's time, right? You got to do it at the right time. If I can just add, um, there's all the folks you read. Um, the customer's not interested in the features; they're interested in the benefits that have addressed the problems they have. Yeah, they don't give. They don't care about how about your how you yeah yeah. They give a shit about their problems, right? I want to know what have you done with my problems. Absolutely. So they just want yeah. to know what the benefits are that help address the problems. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And the, when I'm, I'm going to be back later on, I feel like I, you know, see all week, try to leave, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going to be back later on, so uh, yeah, feel free to come up and talk to me over a beer. So uh, he beats uh, later on about 8 p.m. So oh, sorry. Up, 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 yeah. I'm doing segment. I see a couple of new faces here as well. Uh, we've got a pretty awesome afternoon tied up for you. To my right is a speaker, his name is Alex Lin, he's Director of Platform at Highline VC. And he's going to be leading a talk on how to affect change, but more importantly, he's going to pre present some alternatives besides the lean process, which I think is going to be extremely interesting. Following that, guys, we're going to go into a panel with three uh, startups. One is TAC, 
One is Bay Street Labs, and the, uh, the third one is Mexis Corporation. And it's a growth and product panel, so that should be pretty uh, pretty exciting for everybody who's looking to do, looking for what to do sort of after you've achieved that product market fit, some growth strategy and experience behind that. So um, I won't take up too much more of your time. I'm going to hand it over to Alex Lynn to, uh, to get his talk started. Everyone give a warm welcome to Alex. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, as Michael said, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about change, uh, change more broadly, how to affect it, because as founders, as people that are working in startups, uh, change is ultimately sort of what you're aiming to accomplish. Uh, and I don't think that there's a single way to accomplish it. Uh, there's just some sort of broad ideas to, uh, yeah, that can be val valuable to think about. Um, so. You know, a bit of my background, uh, I'm director of Platform at Pipeline, uh, which is a early stage venture capital fund here in Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, I've spent most of my life so far helping organizations scale. I've worked with large organizations in the agency world, uh, some of the largest companies on the planet, like Absolute Vodka or Adidas Originals, helping them figure out how to make better use of technology to develop new revenue streams in the future. Um, and I've also sort of spent a lot of time in the venture capital world, which has given me a unique sort of lens on the full spectrum and breadth of companies from sort of two to three man shows uh, to, you know, multi thousand person companies. Companies. Um, and I've learned a lot about sort of how change happens in an organizational context. And I figured that I'd share a few of those lessons today. Um, and, and more importantly, right, because this is the Lean Conference, you've been hearing about Lean all day. And I think Lean has done great things for the startup world, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, at the end of the day, I, I'd argue, in fact, that in many cases, when it's followed maybe too prescriptively, it's hurt more people than it's helped. Um, and I think it's really important if there's anything that I leave you with by the time you walk out this door today to be able to think, you know, about, you know, how you spend your time in the company, how you're building your product, how you're building your company in a way that, that doesn't necessarily look to follow some, you know, uh, Bible or gospel, but that, that takes a bit of your own common sense into account. Um, so just to dive into it. Um, you know, whether you're in a startup or in a large organization, um, really the, the thing that's at the core of it is people. And those people tend to work together in really different forms depending on the scale. In large companies, you tend to have a really top-down structure. In smaller companies, you tend to have a sort of like more bottom-up structure where everybody has a more distributed set of responsibilities. This really affects how people will come to, you know, create results. Um, because in a top-down world, you will only be able to affect change if you get permission to do so. There are always people on top of you that are vetting your actions, right? There's somebody that is telling you what your job is, how to do your job, how to carry it out. Um, which really means that a large organization can only affect change as fast as the sort of chain of command's ability to assimilate the idea. In a small organization, that is not the case at all. There's nobody there that's there to tell you how to do your job from, from you know, day one. It's up to you to figure out what your job is, how to do it, and et cetera, which really means that it boils down to initiative. And these are two sort of worlds apart. In one case, it's about you figuring out what to do and having you know, the gut um, and, and trust to go off and do it. In the other case, it's about you being able to convince people that the things that, you're really, that you really care about um, should get accomplished. Um, and you know, this, this permission can really take time. Um, whereas when it's a single person that can just go off and do something, that doesn't necessarily take much time at all. And so really the Achilles heel here in both cases, and in the one case is speed and the other one is planning. Because in the large organization's case, it can take forever, as I was saying. And in the small organization's case, it doesn't take much time at all. But as a byproduct of that, really what it means is that small companies typically don't end up thinking as much about what they put out the door as large companies do. And, you know, the reality end of the day is that the one thing that nobody escapes is the judgment of the market. Right? And so whether you're a large company or a small company, you need to make sure that what you're doing is going to be palatable. And in a large company context, 
because of the fact that you need to sell it up the chain to multiple people all the time, you need to force yourself to develop strong arguments and strong reasoning as to why you're going to do the things that you're doing, right? Because you're developing internal palatability before the external world ever sees it or touches it. In a small company context, that rarely ever happens. It's just kind of like, oh, fun, that could be cool. Let's go off and do it. And then you're hit with the reality that most of the time, people don't want that thing, or they can't, don't care about that thing, or it just doesn't work. And you know, when I look at that, I say, well, often it's because you didn't actually stop and think about why you were doing what you were about to do. Um, and so, frankly, large organizations' hierarchy of approval is, for the most part, you know, a bit of an insurance policy against idiocy, because the fact that you need to, you know, go back to your stakeholders and justify every decision is actually a great one in some respect. Yes, it comes at the cost of speed, but more often than not, it puts you in a situation where the things that you put out the door actually matter to people, because the guys that are at the top or the, you know, the people that are at the top will not let junk through. And obviously, right, there's, there's some exceptions to that. Um, there's always exceptions to the rule, but you know, if, if you look at a lot of large successful organizations, you'll see that that's the case. Right? We talk about Apple, we see it, say, oh, they're such an innovative company. And you can't take it away from them. They make amazing products and you know, they are super successful. Are they innovative? I wouldn't qualify Apple as being the most innovative company on the planet. They take, for the most part, other people's innovations and they're really good at reassembling them in ways that are really pal palatable to people. So what they do is they actually sit forever without trying to experiment on multiple ideas and they wait until that one thing is just so right and so palatable that they can put it out the door. Um, and so really, if you, if you look at it, the balance is that while slowness often costs large organizations their business, a lack of planning costs startups their future in many cases, right? And so it's a, it's a bit of that balance, right? Um, and in a world where, you know, I believe pretty much anything can be done, right, which is the startup world, the question is not what can we do, it's what should we be doing, right? And, and I think that's a bit of the forcing function that happens in a large organizational context. And so, if we come back and sort of draw an analogy to the lean movement and methodology, um, there's a large focus on you know shipping an MVP and increasing your speed and getting things out the, the, out the door. And I think all of those things are really great. Right? And as I said earlier, they've done more you know good than they have done harm uh, for the startup world, generally speaking. But in trying to attain that speed and trying to make things that are minimal. Um, you often end up putting things out there that don't bear a chance. Um, and I think the lesson here is think a bit about what you're going off to do and why it matters to people before you put it into a product form. Because I'd argue that there's too many people that are starting to work on their products too early, period. Right? An MVP sort of is a product. The lean philosophy is made to like go out and get you shipping right away. And when you're shipping right away, you're not thinking. You're not thinking in a way that's strategic and that necessarily fits into the long-term sort of business objectives of your company. Because there's a very real difference between a product and a business. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to remember that and to think about, yeah, once you put that product out the door, how is it gonna become a business for you? And a lot of those come back into this sort of planning phase. Um, and I think you can really do yourselves a favor by not necessarily trying to slow down, but trying to be a little more intentional about your decisions is really what I'm getting to. So that was sort of lesson number one. Number two, to come back to it, is that if you look at the center of any of those circles, whether it was a startup or a large Fortune 500 company, what's at the core is people. And whether you like it or not, change starts with people, but it also ends with people. If the people in your company are not on board 
the change won't materialize. And this happens time and time again. It happens in sort of the you know, most successful contexts in the world, right? You take, and successful in large quotes, right? You take consultancies like McKinsey that are in the business of changing successful organizations and they get brought in to multi-billion dollar contracts to you know, revamp how an entire nation is working or to you know, specifically restructure a department. And then they have this elaborate plan and they put it on the table and they say, great, this is what you need to do and everybody buys in and has a big smile on their face. And then they leave and the thing just goes down the shitter. Um, and it's often not like that, obviously. They do have some success and, and this is not you know, singling them out uh, specifically. I'm just saying, you know, often, Plans that don't account for how people will implement them, plans that don't account for the reality of the folks on the ground, um, end up not functioning. Because if the people in your own organization aren't bought into the idea of the change, the change won't happen. They're the people that are on the front lines. They're the people that, in the end, will make the change successful or not. Right? So you can say that you are the most transparent and you know, uh, honest and et cetera company in the world. If none of your employees actually believe that, that change won't happen. Right? And so it comes back to the paradox of like you take Enron, for example, and Enron had all these great corporate values um, that were like posted in the lobby of their headquarters. Um, and then one day you know, they had a major PR crisis, an issue on their hands, and all of those values basically stood against their behavior. And I think that that dichotomy is really, really interesting to look at because it comes back to the people on their ground, their actions, um, their realities. And I think if you want change to take root, it starts at the people level. Because being able to spot the future, right, to come back to implementing change and being able to create the future are two different things. The people will create the future um, only if you create the right environment for them to do so. Um, and so that, that second lesson is, is simply, you know, that many founders design their products at the expense of designing their businesses. If you're a founder, if you're a manager, if you're a person that's inside a company right now and that you're trying to help your company grow, you need to give as much thought, maybe even more, about how you're going to make your company a place that people want to work at, how you're going to make a com your company a place that people can successfully get the things that they care about out the door. You're going to need to give some thought to those things. And people always ignore that stuff, and they just assume that it'll magically work. And really, it's like there's, there's an unconscionable amount of attention that goes into that in, in successful companies. Most of a CEO's job in any single place is, you know, thinking about his employees and, and or her employees and how, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to perform best and, and what she or he can do to help them. Um, and so I think really the idea here is Think about all those processes. Think about what you're doing to get your people working together more efficiently. Think about what you can do to increase your impact but the impact of the people around you. Because really what it boils down to is great products are built by great companies. And if you don't have a great company, you likely won't have a great product. Right? They're sort of codependent. And obviously there's phases of this and you can have, go through phases where you have an amazing product and a company that's kind of, you know, not perfectly structured, that happens. But on the long term, at the macro scale, it's rare that you know, great products will continue being shipped by mediocre companies. And that's why, you know, to this day, startups that are now large companies like Google spend so much time and thought thinking about how they're structured, how they're operating. Right? Google just kind of led a massive corporate restructuring to become Alphabet. Well, yeah, that, that's partly financial, and, and, and it's a really smart move from that respect. Um, but it's also structurally a new method for them to deploy resources, assets, dollars on the ground. Um, and that will change the types of results and the kind of change that they accomplish. Um, and, and, you know, I, I stumbled upon this quote uh, a while ago, and um, I thought it was really great and encapsulated the idea nicely. And, and it's from Mark Andreessen, who uh, I'm sure most of you know one of the world's most famed VCs at this point. Um, and it says the number one reason that we pass on entrepreneurs we'd otherwise like to back is they're focusing on a product at the exclusion of everything else. Right? And I think that reiterates the idea. If the only thing that you're caring about is your product, you're probably doing it wrong. Third thing, um, you know, 
this process here, getting that chain of command to assimilate the change, it can take years, because literally what you're doing is you're trying to get people inside your organization on board with your plan, and you're trying to find ways to get their brains sort of in sync with your brains. Um, and, and we know that it can take years, because we often look at it and we laugh at how slow they are, right? And then we look at ourselves over here, and we kind of, you know, don't think that it can take years. Um, and when it doesn't work, we kind of go like, oh, well, uh, I guess it wasn't meant to happen, and we kind of brush it off. Um, and I could argue that that's a little foolish because that process can take years as well, right? Because um, at the end of the day, it's about refactoring internal perception versus refactoring external perception. If you're doing something that is fundamentally new, whether it's on the inside or on the outside, there are many people that will have no understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and why they need it in their lives or why that company, your company, is, is, is trying to do it, right? Which means that you're going to be in the business of distributing why that matters to those people, whether it's on the inside or the outside, before that change can take root. Because back to the market thing, ultimately, the one thing you'll never escape is the judgment of the market, right? Um, and if they don't get what you're up to, or if they don't get why this matters, um, well, you're out of luck, right? And I think that's the important part to remember here, which is, um, that whether you're a small company or a large company, change can take a really long time. Um, and that, you know, pivots are awesome, but you can't expect to create lasting change if you pivot at the first sight of, you know, danger every time, right? Because internally, if you really cared about that change in a large organization, you'd probably work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it until one manager and the next manager and the next manager have all sort of bought into it to a point where the organization has decided like, yep, okay, we're ready to do this. It's sort of similar in the startup world, except the people that you're trying to convince aren't necessarily internally. All of those people are on board. They're sort of externally. They don't get why this matters yet. And your job is to help them get why it matters, right? And so, if the first sign, or if the first thing that you do when you meet a bit of resistance there is say, well, there wasn't any fit, so you know, let's just change the entirety of our direction, which I'd argue, you know, coming back to the lean philosophy and, and the idea of shipping quickly and MVPs and learning from your users and iterating, et cetera, I think there's, there's a tendency to you know, adjust very quickly, and I think all of those things are great. Um, but I think it's also about understanding um, you know, what needs adjusting and what you need to continue sort of putting pressure on and, and, and sticking to. Um, because I see too many companies these days um, that basically pivot for eternity um, until they're out of runway entirely, meaning in term, in, meaning until they're either out of cash if they had any, or until they're out of time and the founders can literally, you know, no longer afford to be out of a salary. And so they just try and try and try and try and try different things, and they're always sort of slightly different versions of things that were always kind of off. Um, and I think. If all you're doing all the time is iterating on a new MVP and putting a different concept out the door um, that you know is minimal but not necessarily viable, um, it's going to be just as tough with the new idea, right? And I think that that you know coming back to the MVP thing, the core word in the entirety of the MVP is is viable. You want to put something out there that is viable to the market. You want to prove your assumption. You want to prove that that, that change can take root and you want to build on it. And, and so I think, you know, back to this work for a while on figuring out specifically how you're going to make a product that's viable to that market, right? And if after a certain amount of time you realize that there's no market for it, it probably means that your product isn't viable and you can change. Just don't necessarily take any sign of resistance or friction as a signal that everything is always off. Right? Um, so those were really the three big things that I wanted to leave you with, which is change takes a lot of time, whether it's in a large organization or a small organization, because you're getting people on board, right? Work with those people to create a great environment internally for them to ship amazing things and for other people to come and want to work with you. Um, and number three, you know, and we're going backwards here, um, you know, number three 
in large organizations, the thing that you're aiming for is permission. In small organizations, the thing that you're aiming for is initiative. That creates a balance or, or, or sort of battle between speed and planning. And remember, when your default is speed because you're a startup, you probably want to be thinking about planning. When your default is planning because you're a large organization, you're, you probably want to be thinking about speed. And being able to sort of inspire yourself from the other and the things that they do really well but that you don't have as a default is probably you know, uh, a thing that will be really beneficial in the long term. Um, so that's, that sort of wraps up um, you know, what I had planned for my chat. Um, but now I'd be happy to, you know, kind of take any questions or, or shed more light on anything specifically or give examples if there's anything that's flying through your minds. I had a question about when it is and is not okay to be having this process happening in the front. You essentially said this external refactoring can have repercussions. If you just launch a product, yeah. you don't think about the intention behind it. There can be a sort of a, a blow Yeah. And in the startup world, we sort of justify the fact that that's okay because we're only reaching two people each time we do this yeah. until we do get too large. And then we have to be sure that the thing that we sort of built is valuable. But by that point, we know it is because otherwise we wouldn't have to reach all those people. Can you make mistakes in the shallow end and then have those iterations be the, and essentially have the time that you get into the deep end be what declares whether those experiments were valuable or not? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think you, you can, right? As I was saying, you know, all of the ideas that I wrote, was putting out there were not to contradict anything that the Lean philosophy is saying. It was more to complement it, right? It was to say, um, yeah, I, I do, and you know, encourage startups to continue thinking sort of very tactically um, about you know their product, their companies, and figuring out how they can, you know, improve that feature, iterate to the next thing, um, but. That doesn't necessarily mean that those iterations are strategic, and right. That's the part to me that often feels a little off. Um, companies are out there to fulfill a purpose, um, and if you're not really sure of what your purpose is, well, it means that the decisions that you're taking on the ground probably aren't fitting to a strategy to get you there. Because really, if you boil down what strategy means, it's kind of the marshalling of finite resources towards predetermined objectives. And so if you know what those predetermined objectives are and that you're setting those really strongly, that you know what you're aiming for, like Airbnb probably knew that it would want it to be in the business of you know, helping people sleep outside of hotels. Right? In the beginning, it was just pump up mattresses on the floor of random strangers' apartments, right? There was no, no renting of full apartments, there was no cozy beds, there was you know, no great online platform, there was no insurance policies, there was none of those things. There was people outside of hotels. They gradually iterated on the product in order to make it better and better and better to get more and more and more people on board. They kind of always knew what their purpose was as a business, what they were trying to do, um, and every single one of their decisions aimed to get them closer to that. That's really what I'm getting to, right? I think that's the planning part, that's the strategy part. It's how do you make sure that the decisions that you're making, that the iterations that you're making somehow line up to a backbone that, you know, isn't just random luck. question, which is, uh, number one, you know, do I see situations in companies whereby, um, you know, they might not be as clear as they should be on where they're going? Then number two, do they sometimes overestimate um, their ability to c compare to their resources? Is, is that kind of where you're going? Or Yeah, well, I guess, you, 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 I think the theme that I got from you yeah. is there's a bit of naivety out there of a lot of founders on well, how much they should invest on the company building yeah. aspect versus the product. And I find that I'm just curious, is, is, is that you see a lot of that when it comes to the people that are that in your... Yeah, network? you always see a lot, right? Because I get back to it, um, the default is build. You know, building has become the easiest thing in the world. And it's also a really sort of rewarding thing, right? Even sort of 
biologically rewarding where like when you're shipping things and putting it out in the world and that it sort of succeeds or that you have your first users that are clicking on the thing and that you're watching your Google Analytics or your mix panel, there's serotonin and like oxytocin and a bunch of stuff flowing through your brains and you're like, yay, this is fun. And then it gets you back into building. It's like, oh, that thing crashed, let me go fix it. And so you're always, your default is your shipping, right? Your default is like, I'm building stuff and this is great. But as a default of building stuff like that and being biologically rewarded to continue doing those things, most of your brain power goes directly at the feature level, right? Um, and when you're at the feature level, you're not necessarily thinking of the business strategy. And when you're thinking, not thinking of the business strategy, that probably means that you're really not thinking about you know, your company and, and how the people work together and you know, how you can increase the likelihood that you reach your targets and all of those things. And I think if you're in any kind of leadership position in a small company or in a large company, it boils back down to the, to the reality that yes, your job is to ensure sort of maximal output of your people towards that strategy that you really believe in. Um, and I do see a lot of founders all the time that have beautiful products, amazing products, you know, really well-crafted things but that don't make as much sense as they should, right? Or companies that because they haven't thought about their processes probably waste 30% of time and resources on things that are sort of unconscionable. Right? Um, and I think that's the beauty of it, right? If, if you're a founder that really cares about the details, if you're a, if you're a manager that really cares about the details, you, you can sweat the small stuff, right? You can, you can go in there and make sure that you're setting up an environment for yourself that optimizes for success on the whole, right? And that it's not just about success for your users at the feature level and making something that's visually appealing and beautiful and that works well. Um, it's also making a company that works well for your people, uh, a company that you know works well for your customers, um, a company that works well for a market, right? All of those kind of things. Yeah, hey, you mentioned that a good team, an enthusiastic team is aligned with your sort of vision is really, really core and essential to build to, to be to build a great company. So I'm I'm wondering from your perspective, what are some of the what are some detrimental things that you've seen inside teams that either break them apart or get them off the uh, off the track of achieving that vision? Uh, or conversely, what are some great strategies for keeping a team together and aligned at the same time? Sure. Uh, great question. Um, you know, so I think obviously at the earliest of stages <coughs> there's always a shared passion for the for the problem or opportunity that's being pursued. Um, the reality is that you're going to see those people inside your company probably more than you're going to see your family or your spouse or your husband. Um, and that really means that you need to be comfortable working with those people um, on the thing that you're setting off to work on 12, 15, 18 hours a day. Right? Um, and so there, there must be some minimal amount of interest in the problem at hand because nobody likes feeling, you know, just like a tool, right? Meaning if somebody's hired you because you're the most amazing developer in the world, but as a developer you actually have no interest in the problem at hand, you're just going to feel like a code monkey. And nobody feels likes feeling that way, right? You want to feel needed, valued, you want to feel like your opinion, your your perspectives on that market, on that problem are interesting, and so I think that's, that's one of the, you know, core things. Um, I then also think that um, sort of operationally at the company level, um, things that increase success are sort of, you know, clarity of, clarity and transparency of sort of direction and objectives through the full stack. Everything from the board down to, you know, the interns. Um, because that permits everybody to be on a page that moves sort of in the benefit of the company as opposed to sort of in random sort of mishap directions, right? Um, and I think if I look at a lot of startups, in many cases, they have what I'd argue to be governance problems, um, meaning where the things that they're sort of excited about on the day to day are totally, you know, a few degrees of separation removed from like where their board's head is at. And so by the time that they sync up with their board, their board is kind of like, oh, we thought that you were doing this or excited to do that um, and deploying your resources against that. And they're like, well, we changed and we're doing all these things. And then half the company's like, what? We never heard of that thing, right? And I think that transparency throughout 
um, and that and, and the goal of that transparency is to get like a clarity of direction and purpose for everybody on board. Uh, I think matters a lot and, and is a huge uh, predominant factor to success. Anything else? Yeah, of course. So you said um, it's always going to be a lot of hard work to convince people either internally or externally yeah. that your idea is, is a good idea. Yeah. When do you start to allow yourself the possibility that you're talking to the wrong people? Yeah, great question. Um, I think. You know, I, I don't know that there's a specific point for that. I think it's a, it's usually largely based on judgment and a really strong hunch. That's just the reality of it, right? Um, but um, you know, you're going to see indicators of that pretty quickly um, as you're putting your product out there um, and sort of quote unquote validating that market, right? Um, because there is such a thing as a product that doesn't have a market, right? And I think as soon as you start proving that your perception of the market for that thing is not actually representative of the market for that thing, uh, I think there's some questioning to be done around whether you want to hold course and explore further or whether there's sort of too high of an opportunity cost and that there's maybe a, a clearer, more apparent market that benefits from a different solution that you could be, you know, serving through some other means. Does that help? I want to build on uh, Michael's question. Um, sure. One of the bigger changes, or biggest changes that um, a startup undergoes when it professionalizes into a business is scaling and culture. Yeah. I was just wondering, what do you see most frequently as the ingredient that startups compromise in scaling that culture? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, once again, great question. Um, when, when you look at culture, I think it's really easy in the same way as your company to focus on the, you know, features level, right? And so it's like, you think about culture, you start talking about ping pong tables and free office booze and, and that kind of stuff, right? That's become synonymous for culture in the startup world. And I think that's kind of broken because those are the features of the culture, right? Really, culture when you boil it down or a shared set of beliefs, values, way of doing things, objectives, et cetera. And I think that's the part of the culture that mat matters a lot more. And the part that startups should be a lot more concerned about sort of distributing evenly within their organization, right? What are the ways in which you expect the people that are around you to behave? If there's some new people that are joining that company, do they sort of fit that or do they not fit that? Right? Um, are they going to increase that sort of perception or decrease that perception relative to all of the others? Um, and I think if you look at you know things like the ping pong tables and all that stuff, they came out of cultures that wanted to emphasize openness and collaboration and fun. And those that those are the things that were you know those were the tactics that were used in order to fit those objectives. And I think in terms of your culture, the question really becomes. For the problem that I'm trying to solve with the people that are around me, what are those core objectives that, that I care about a lot? Um, and what kind of tactics will get me closer to that um, in a way that you know probably increases the odds of, of the company's survival in the long term? Um, what's, um, what's your favorite book or startups? And why do you think they're great? Um, well, yeah, there's there's always a, a ton of companies. Um, we invested in a company called Foodie that's based here in Toronto, but also has an office in Vancouver and is expanding rapidly everywhere. Um, I think that they're pretty awesome because so Foodie is sort of a you know food delivery concierge for the corporate world is really the best way to put it. Um, they enable companies to order you know large amount of foods for their employees uh, the touch of a finger, and I think that's fascinating because it taps into sort of. Uh, what I argue to be excess capacity in the same way that Uber taps into excess capacity or TaskRabbit taps into excess capacity um, in creating better utilization for you know the taxi industry in Uber's case. Well, what, what you know, Foodie does is enable restaurants around any city in the world um, eventually to increase the utilization rates of their kitchen um, and make sure that on the day to day um, they're making more money uh, all while you know not having to increase their costs because the chefs and the material and all that um, is is there on the ground already um, so I think that's a you know a, a an interesting one that I, I care a lot about. Um, one that we had invested in my last fund is a company called uh, Van Hawks, 
Um, Van Hox is an amazing smart bike company that's based here in Toronto that went through Y Combinator. Um, they are building the world's first carbon fiber smart bike, smart bike which really means um, you know, uh, it tells you how to get across the, around the city. It has turn-by-turn -turn navigation built into the handlebars. It has blind spot detection, so that if you're changing lanes and that there's a car that's coming in behind you, um, you you know reduce your likelihood of an accident. Uh, it has fast notification on it, so if the bike starts moving and it's not paired to your phone, you're going to get a push notification that tells you, hey, you know, there's some kind of mismatch here. Um, so I think that's a you know phenomenally interesting company uh, that is in the hardware space, and we don't see um, all that many hardware companies uh, coming out of Toronto, um, which, you know, I think uh, is, uh, is a thing that's valuable um, as well. It just doesn't get as much attention as it should sometimes. Um, and then, uh, you know, well, th this one's no longer around, but I do think that they did amazing things for Toronto, uh, and it was Tihan and Lax, and they're not a product company. Um, they were a design studio, um, but, you know, they helped to design some of the best tools in the world, some stuff that you guys probably use every day. Uh, Tihan and Lax was, you know, hired by Evan Williams at Twitter when they started building out Medium to do the first version of Medium, and Medium has now become sort of one of the largest platforms for sort of startup knowledge uh, and et cetera um, out there today. Uh, and that all came out of Toronto people, and they were acquired by Facebook uh, less than a year ago, um, and sort of merged it into the, to the design team over there. Um, but I think their effect and impact on the Toronto startup community, uh, product community, and culture remains. Um, Does that wrap it up for everybody? Any last minute sort of questions, ideas, comments? Cool. All right. Thank you. Cool guys, so we're gonna we're gonna start off now with the, with the panel on growth and product strategy. This should be pretty interesting now. Um, we've got Babs here from Mexus Corporation. We've got Mike from Bay Street Labs. And on the end, we've got Jonathan Holby from TAC, who's also been helping us put this awesome event together tonight. So uh, give a big round of applause to your panelists. And Alex Lynn, of course, is going to be doing the panel for you. Great, so uh, go ahead and let you take it away then. Yeah, thanks so much for the warm intro again, Michael. Um, I think that the best way to you know start the panel uh, is probably for everybody to introduce themselves and tell a bit more about their company and what they do and what they're up to, uh, because I'm, I'm sure you might know a, a bit of what these guys do, uh, but not in any kind of depth, and, and uh, it'd be valuable for us to start on the same page, so uh, Jonathan, I'll let you kick off. So I'm the CEO of a hiring community, and our goal, which we're sort of still in the process of just like fully forming down into, is to provide anyone who's looking for either a job or a, a, a new employee to find that through their social networks instead of through a job board or through a recruiter or an agency like that. There's a bunch of reasons why we think that's incredibly valuable, but the most important one is that the majority of people who find a new opportunity these days find it through a referral from a friend or through an opportunity that they were connected to socially, either at a networking event or something else like that. And we want to really hammer home on that process that works because so much of the rest of the hiring process seems to be so fundamentally broken and requires all of this effort, all this pain, without re sort of resulting in a whole lot of reward. So we want to focus on the human side of that. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I'm Mike from Bay Street Labs, and uh, we're, uh, we're building out uh, a, a new way to approach uh, financial audits. And so what, we, what we're doing is we're applying machine learning and automation to a very manual, uh, a very manual process. So you've got you know, a financial auditor that goes to a business that then takes uh, in and goes through all their financial documents. And what we do is we actually automate a lot of those processes. So um, my role within uh, my, my role within Bay Street Labs is, uh, is just one of the co-founders. So we practice uh, holacracy, so we have general roles and we sort of evolve and move around um, given, uh, given the different kind of tasks. So it's a, it's a bit of a new uh, management style, but I think it's, it's been uh, just pretty fun so far. Hi guys, uh, my name is Babs Ajayi, I'm uh, from Mexis Corporation. So we have a web platform for trading commodities. Essentially, we provide buyers of all commodities like copper beans, rice, from all over the world, a platform where they can buy the products within the same time they would take them to order it themselves. And what we've done is uh, we've found ways to streamline the risks and all the other 
backend things that normally come with some backlogs and lots of delays that can range from a month to six months. And what we do is by taking care of those, deals can move faster in a very short amount of time. Sometimes within a day, you can have the entire shipment on the seas moving towards the buyer's uh, destination. Awesome. Thanks so much, Babs. Um, so, you know, that's three really different markets. We have, you know, hiring and HR with Jonathan, sort of financial tools um, with, with Mike and, and Babs on your end, sort of commodity trading. Um, the, the question that sort of interests me is, when you look at growth for your company, what does that mean? Are you measuring growth through sort of, you know, user engagement, through revenue, through uh, user acquisition? Um, you know, growth is a pretty large term, and I'd love to, to understand sort of what what specifically in the context of company of your co own company, what the, how you look at it? I guess I'll go first. Um, we we're just under a year in our in our process. What we're looking at is, uh, is like in terms of for growth itself, is we're looking at how um, how when we're engaging with the with the auditors and and people that actually produce uh, uh, that do the financial audits and then those that actually. Um, that go through the financial audits and then d engaging with the regulators, we check to see back in terms of how our product, that um, how that fits within that, and then um, trying to see the responses, engaging the responses. At this stage, that's about, the, about as far as we can really go. We have our end vision, but we can't really go much, uh, much further than on, uh, than on a short-term basis for it. So every company will have a KPI of some kind, um, and I think that what's really interesting about the growth process as products develop is that the KPI will either have been identified from the beginning and then followed through on in a really meaningful way, or it will have changed over time. And as we've landed on the idea that a candidate referral is one of the most important things to getting a new job or to finding a new employee, we've focused on that as our KPI. So you know, we have a certain number of job postings which will come in each week. We focus on the number of candidate referrals that each posting will get. And that's sort of our, our uh, that's our measure of growth. So for us, uh, growth is kind of measured more in terms of uh, user engagement. Since uh, we deal in an industry that has, it's just starting to come around to technology in the sense that people will trade in commodities from all over the world, through silk route and then you know, shares. And nowadays, the people are starting to use technology to trust that process. So our growth is measured by how many people can we get to from month to month in terms of people who can now trust to use the platform to know if they put their money in escrow, it's going to be safe there and they have the control as well as they know they're going to get their product when it's guaranteed because that's also a big problem within the commodity trade. You can order something from China and then wait for maybe two months, three months after you were expected it. So then knowing those things gives us the user engagement statistics that we're always looking at. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and so, tactically speaking, what are you guys doing? Are there any specific processes or tools internally um, that you're using in order to, you know, optimize for those KPIs and make sure that they are growing on the day to day? Um, you know, what are your thoughts around that? What are you, you know, concretely uh, doing on the ground to make sure that you're, you're, you know, uh, succeeding? There is a piece not too long ago, I can't remember exactly how long, a couple weeks ago, about what a couple of people thought were the hardest problem in the startup world when you're trying to get a company off the ground. And the conclusion that they touched on that resonated with me was product market fit. And it's not so much in our company that there's a tweak to our platform or a new way of looking at our metrics that indicates the next version of the product that's gonna have a higher return on the KPI that we're measuring. It's instead, how close are we to really understanding exactly what the market is really looking for when we're solving this problem? And so every week we go through an iteration, we sort of measure it by what's our understanding of how this process is being done in the world to date, and how well do we help whatever our little portion of that process is really succeed. So, you know, we have, we have a metric sheet, same as everyone else does, and, and on that we sort of track all of the things that we think are relevant to our business. And at the end, it sort of always comes clear that the thing that has made the most difference in that past week is we've learned something about the process that was being done before, and this time, it's enabled us to sort of see 
you know, a greater degree of success. And so we then sort of solidify that, move that through back into the product, and we go into the next phase. So it's very much about learning. So for for tools itself that we use, um, we, we find that um, that uh, that uh, we, we like to limit as many tools as others, tools for literally everything out there. And so we've tested a whole bunch of them, but uh, but we like to use um, uh, on the CRM side, we really like to use uh, uh, HubSpot. Um, so that's a way to, for us to be able to track our engagement. So as we're because we have so many different different uh, customer segments, we want to make sure that we're tracking our engagement levels and seeing how. How our product is evolving and tying that back uh, to our um, within Slack itself to be able to see um, to send the communications in a way to our development teams. We've got you know we're a team of ten people and, uh, and we're finding as we're growing that communication is, is getting more and more difficult and and so uh, those are more or less the, the only two tools. Actually, we also use a, a tool called Do um, to be able to track meetings. So that way we can we can start to formulate our, our KPIs as we're as we're growing. In terms of what tools, uh, there are two that we tend to use, and the first one that's really a big favorite of mine is a wonder list. So in terms of just putting all the tasks that need to be achieved on a week to week basis, so everyone has access to each other's wonder list, they can see what the other person is supposed to be doing. And then the second one, I, wouldn't, I'm not, I don't know if it's classified as a tool, it's talking. And that means you know talking to the customers, talking to the stakeholders in terms of the employees of the company, and every Friday from two to four, we sort of, you know, after trading is done overseas, we sit down and we talk for that two hours, just learning what went on during the week, how can we improve the next coming week. And what that does is it allows for openness because then people can come to me as a CEO say, hey, a couple of things that I, I was expecting to go another way this weekend. It's more communication. And even with the customers, they always have expectations that are met. And they can say, you know, you guys did it this way, can you improve this way? And even if it's the other way around, they will tell you and let you know. And that's really how you get to view the product the way and envision it when you were starting out as a startup. Because I think that's a great point. And, and you know, on that point of, of talking, spending time with your customers, your employees, uh, assessing what's gone wrong, what you can do better. Um, have any of you ever been in a situation where you've sort of realized that you were measuring the wrong thing? Um, and the you know you you desperately needed to change that and sort of how did you come to that realization um, or if, if you are still measuring the right thing at which point um, you know after a sort of series of underperforming uh, results um, have you sort of chosen to to start doing something about it um, and, and kind of you know how do you approach those situations or problems? I, I can start. That's a that's a, a great question. Um, what what we what we did is we went down to a conference in uh, Infinity. I've got to give a bit of a backstory to it. And so we have all of these tools and all these uh, all these uh, market solutions. And so what we realized was that uh, when we went out when we went out to a, a fintech conference, you know that there was so much demand for all the different kinds of tools. And what we really had to do was decide decide on whether we want to focus on all these different tools or whether we want to zero in and focus in on, on the core product and then evolve from there. And so we're literally in the process right now for assessing the market fits within these different things, what the opportunities are, and how to be able to, uh, within our end vision, and how to be able to actually take what we've got right now and, uh, and all these different, and weighing that against all the other different tool opportunities and seeing what the best interest is for us. So it's, it really, it causes us to actually really focus more than more than anything else, and that's uh, uh, that's the one thing we're really learning right now. So it's it's you know how to really cut things back. I would say for us, in terms of a tool that we started using that we realized wasn't working, it would have to do with email marketing. So when we first started out, there were you know, lots of ways of getting access to you know emails of people who were trading, either buying or selling commodities, and communicating with people through emails was always something that. It took a longer time to get to the person, and also the responses were not as favorable. And then it was just by accident we, that we discovered it. You know, we just a couple of us just picked up the phone one day and said, "Let's just call someone in African, you know, in Nigeria. Let's talk to them and see you know, what they think of the product we're offering or what they think of the service." And we picked up the phone, and the people 
we were on the phone for about 45 minutes and they just, the call was supposed to take maximum maybe seven minutes and just ask them a couple of questions. And we were like, wow, like, we're getting more engagement from people this way. So, you know, the email marketing switched to more phone. We still, you know, email people to, you know, update them on deliveries and update them on, you know, product timelines. But now just when it comes to marketing, it's about talking to them either face to face, having people go locally to them in their locations or even just picking up the phone, talking to them on the phone. Skype is another thing that we've been able to maximize that in that way. Thanks so much, Babs. Jonathan, you were smiling when I said, you know, you have a story of, you know, realizing that you were measuring the wrong thing. So I suspect you do. So. The, I, I know every startup goes through this. And I think that one of the most interesting things about starting a company is that looking backwards at the, the revamps makes it seem so painfully obvious what, what is true. And then trying to predict that out of the future is like next to impossible. It's an impossible problem. So we started out doing exactly what all other hiring companies that are on the technology sort of side of it try and do. They sort of measure the number of people who have seen a job opportunity. They take a look at how many of those either engaged with the opportunity in some way or submitted a resume or did something else to show that they were interested in it. And then sort of, you know, it, we sort of came to the conclusion, if you can reach enough people in the right way, they're going to apply to the job and everything's going to be great. And the truth is that either the numbers for that are impossible and they need to be up in the hundreds of thousands to a couple hundreds of thousands for a job board to be able to sufficiently serve its market of employers. Or there's like a fundamentally different way to be looking at this game. And it took us, you know, not a huge amount of time, three months I would say, to really get our head around what was wrong about that sense of difference between showing things to people who should be interested in it and waiting for them to be interested or directly asking them and engaging with them about what really makes it interesting to them or not. And once we did, it was a, fun, it was a huge pivot. It went from you know, our, our weekly traction being in the neighborhood of 5,000 to 6,000 people reached down to 20. But our number of people actually helped was 20. And that had, it had been zero or one before. Uh, thanks so much. That's, uh, that's a great insight. Um, so, you know, uh, just to be cognizant of time, because I'm not sure if there's a... Oh, you've got time. Yeah? OK, yeah. cool. Um, so, you know, in, in serving your markets as well, you know, when we talk about growth, um, I think that another thing that comes in is, is sort of customer segments, right? And, and you were sort of uh, alluding it to it sort of slightly in your comment there, uh, Jonathan, but um, I think as a company grows, you realize that there's some people out there that you weren't formally serving that you know, might possibly uh, have a lot of value for your company. Um, can, you, can you walk us through a, uh, a moment where you uh, basically realized a bit of a, an opportunity uh, that you hadn't you know, formally foreseen uh, and, and sort of how you went about um, trying to tackle that um, and the dilemma of, you know, do we go off and shift a lot of resources and trying to tackle that now or do we sort of wait off and try to do a better job at what we're doing now? Because I think every founder and every startup employee often ends up with a bit of that dilemma of like, oh my God, you know, there's so many things that I can be doing. There's so much opportunity, but then they just don't know how to deploy their own resources and time on the back of that um, in order to, to accurately you know, um, or successfully grow the company and, and, and uh, the product. Um. So uh, in terms of the customer segments that were not actually served, for us, uh, when we started out, you know, when we first started about five years ago, our goal was to help a small farmer in Africa bring over his COVID bills uh, to North America. So, we were very focused on helping those very little guys. And we sort of saw exporters and people with more registered businesses exporting as sort of the middleman who was taking advantage of those uh, small farmers. But over time, we started talking and then we started breaking down exporters into the big players, you know, the medium players, and then the little guys. And we saw the same dynamics that we were seeing was also happening to those exporters whereby some of them were very underserved in their marketplace, whereas the larger corporations were the ones that sort of would, at the most, position of taking advantage of the small farmers. So when we started bringing those people into the fold, 
how sort of mind frames started changing and we started seeing more engagement in terms of people who were actually up. Because obviously, getting to the small farmer took maybe two, three weeks, but then when you included small exporter who was also having problems in accessing the international market, that was, so that was a huge part in terms of the other customer segment. And even something like Jonathan that I alluded to in terms of when you're targeting that customer segment, it's also about, it's always, when you look back, you know, you look back and you're like, wow, like, I missed, how did I miss that? So it's always easier looking back and, you know, when you're looking forward. And it's sort of the biggest challenge for co-founders is being able to, you know, have that situation where when you're looking at something, you're not so micro-focused into the, the smaller things. You can maybe take a step back every now and then to see the larger picture. And I feel that helps when you're just starting up and just starting. So, uh, go, you know, when, when going back to when I, when, I, when we were down in New York pitching at uh, at Finity, we had so many different opportunities that that uh, that came came to us. One was from uh, you know American Express, Capital One. So that, so when you're looking at it from um, like the credit card companies, you also had banks that were looking looking at using some of our solutions in, in, uh, in another particular way, and then we also had. Our core product, which is um, that, you know, the core of the business, which is to empower small to mid-sized um, accounting companies to be able to act like a for a firm. So when we're, you know, we've been building our platform towards towards the small to mid, you know, having a having as a way to uh, empower the small to mid-sized firm. So we really had to, and we still are still assessing the market fit for the products in terms of what the what the whether we take a short term. Um, a short-term gain of that, um, in order to be able to have a you know influx in, uh, in in capital this way and, and white labeling and all those other things, or it, sticking to the core platform and building up users on multiple different sides for the for the long-term growth. Because on the development point, it makes it very difficult to uh, um, you know you're either putting all the development efforts in, in, in one side or another, and it's it's really seeing what the what the real value is that uh, that would be in the, in the long term for the business. So. It's it's ongoing for us, but you know it comes down to focus and, and trying to use um, metrics and, and KPIs as a way to see what the value is um, for now and for the and for the long term and and kind of sticking to the core of what uh, of what the business what the business is and not being being pulled by so many different shiny objects along the way that uh, that could sidetrack you on the mission you're trying to improve. That shiny objects comment is an important one, I think, because. Ultimately speaking, to the answer to your question is that there is always something of value that you can offer a customer base. Sometimes the customer base is tiny, sometimes it's huge. And even from the very day one of your company, there is something that you can do to help the person that you ultimately want millions of people to look like. And you know, for us it was a very straightforward thing. It was literally, hey, you, you're having trouble filling this role, allow us to try and help you find someone who can fill that role. But sometimes it's really easy to say, well, there's this many candidates in the marketplace and this many employers in the marketplace and they all want to meet in this way. Let's build a system for filtering thousands of people. And it just, ultimately speaking, I think it just doesn't work that way. You have to focus on the one thing that you can do that actually makes a difference to start with. And then turn that one thing into two things and then 10 things and then 10,000 things. The shiny, the shiny objects problem is how to identify what the valuable thing is and what's, you know, yeah, totally. I think that's a great point, Jonathan. Um, you know, isolating and being able to, to really know, um, you know, that that sort of hard nub that makes your company the thing that it is, that is entirely sort of yours and different from everybody else out there, and then capitalizing on, on that knowledge and that insight, I think, is really important. You know, when we look at investments uh, from a venture capital standpoint, I think that's that's one of the things that matters the, the most to any VC, really. It's sort of not necessarily the product that you're building or the market that you're serving, but sort of what's your insight on that market? Um, what's that thing, you know, in, in a peer keel way uh, that, that you believe to be true that nobody else is sort of thinking yet, right? Um, because it's all about that outlook that will shape your approach to the market um, and your, your solution to it. Um, and, and I think as investors, what we typically look for uh, is you know, unique insights um, that 
are sort of outliers compared to the norm. Um, and people that are chasing those unique insights with discernible passion um, and uh, you know energy. Um, so you know, I've asked a lot of questions about growth and product here, um, but I figured maybe there's a bunch of stuff that you have in your minds that you're really wondering about that you've never really had the opportunity to ask founders about. Um, so I, I'd love to you know uh, give anybody in the crowd the opportunity to ask a question to the panel, uh, and, and you know we'll, we'll try to answer as best as possible. Is there anything that's burning on, on top of your mind in terms of uh, you know? how people are picking their markets, uh, the metrics that they're choosing, uh, sort of anything around growth, growth hacking, uh, product development, etc. cetera. First, uh, personally, um, I am very interested to find out um, from each one of you, uh, what were the personality traits, uh, the expertise or skills of the individuals who help you the most to solve the challenges, the problems, and provide an you know, innovative approach. I am interested what kind of personality those individuals had, uh, what kind of expertise, what was something unique about those individuals that helped you come up with new approaches to solve the problem. Thanks, great question. Anybody want to start? I would say the first one is obviously uh, they have to be generalists and people who are willing to learn when it comes to general tasks. Because when we first started out, uh, when we were three at the time, so we had to do research, we had to do accounting, research, legal research, research the products, the market. And I had an economics and finance background as well as a computer science. My other partner, she had a finance background and philosophy. And the last person was a medical science student. So we were very, when it comes to commodities trading, the first couple of months, we'll, we'll talk to people and they'll say, what's your background? And they tell them, like, what are you doing here? And you know, <laughs> at the time, it was already daunting for a couple of 20-something year olds talking to people in commodities trading. So now knowing you don't have the educational experience for that, but people were willing to learn. We, you know, we had to learn. Uh, just last week, we were doing, working on our new training manual for our new employees. And there is about 2,700 terminologies that are used in day-to-day -day trading. And over a six-month period, we had to learn it ourselves. You know, we had to educate ourselves in every step of the way, just to make sure whenever the customer gave us that opportunity, we're up to the task and we're able to you know, present something that was valuable. So the first skill would be people who are always willing to learn, and they're very general in their skill set in terms of things they can pick up. The second one will obviously be people who have thick skin. And I think this one is probably the most valuable of all because with the startup world, you can be up here today and the next thing you're down here in terms of there are always victories and there are always very terrible lows in terms of defeats. And the process is all of being able to you know, learn from the mistakes when you make them, but also when you wake up the next day knowing yesterday was yesterday. It's a brand new day, it's a brand new 24 hours or 18 hours, depending on how much you work. And knowing you have to go at it with a new mindset, you can't let whatever happened in the past, whether it's a victory or a defeat, affect you going forward. For uh, when it was just the founding team, uh, it, you know, when uh, my, my partner and you know, I were putting, putting together the team, what we were looking for, um, like I, we both had multiple years worth of, uh, worth of entrepreneurial experience. So, we knew the kinds of, of founders we wanted to have on the team, um, and we knew that the best, uh, they, they, they sort of, um, what we really wanted to look for were, were people that have been been there, that uh, that have gone through gone through the challenge. And so, experience was was uh, was one point of it, but but also having a combination of the right attitude and aptitude. And so, um, that means they were smart, curious, willing to learn, and also willing to ask the right questions. And so, we've. You know, we've grown to, grown to a team of 10 on that sort of foundation. So they were generalists um, that had a you know, specific kind of talents uh, along the way. But overall, it was about creating a culture that uh, of very intelligent people that can, that can be willing to grow, that we saw that we can grow and evolve um, the, the company and build, build teams further along down, down the line. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of... Uh, 
one of the other things uh, actually that uh, if we're looking outside of outside of the organization, actually having um, everybody be able to reach out and have their own network of people that they can lean on and, and to be able to introduce different people along the way that can help uh, that can help grow them as as we as we grow along. So um, you know, just by having the right kinds of uh, right kind of support networks along the way, it also sort of helps out uh, on, uh, on on that angle. It's just curiosity, you know, having the right attitude, smart, experience, those were the core things we were looking at for, for our, uh, our founding team. I won't say much to add to that except that there's a sentiment amongst our team, but also every other founder I've ever met, that there's a passion that goes with how they feel about a problem space. Sometimes that's because they're builders and they love finding problem spaces and then building things to solve those problems. And sometimes it's because I think there is a personality trait that you can identify as passion. And it's sort of best summarized as a willingness to set your own, yourself on fire in order to try and accomplish some goal. As long as the goal is good enough, founders genuinely will do that. It's ridiculous, but it's true. And you know, there's a whole ton of problems that you will go through in this ridiculous journey that are utterly unsolvable unless you just sort of dive into them and try and figure it out while you're diving. And you can't do that. That's got to be the most important thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a few things based on sort of what I've seen at scale from, you know, speaking with, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of founders at this point uh, that, that I think are, are marked characteristics of, of success across the board um, in, in founders generally, but also typically in, in sort of employees that, uh, are, are highly creative in their output uh, and successful in their output. Um, and, and those are three things specifically, um, sort of in the Larry Page way of saying it, a, a healthy disregard for the impossible, right? Um, people uh, that start with the assumption that the way things are currently done is not the best possible way to go from there, right? People that are, that are able to fundamentally rethink, uh, you know, any given problem set in reality and, and, and question whether their solution is the optimal solution. Um, number two, sort of what I'd argue to be high fluid intelligence, right, which means an, an ability to uh, go from one task to another without being phased, without being thrown off track. Um, and that matters a lot in, in great founding teams. Um, you know, some founders are great designers but have an utter inability to deal with any, anything else in the business. Well, not sure that that's going to be the best kind of personality to lead that business and grow that business into the future. Um, and then the third thing is sort of a, a proven track record of executing on past intentions. And that doesn't need to be in the corporate context. It can be anywhere, really. You can look at sort of school. You could look at personal projects. You could look at just their attitude towards life generally. But an ability to do the things that they say that they're going to do and prove that they're realizing them, that shows people that are determined, people that are go-getters, people that are, you know, care a lot about accomplishing the challenges that they set up for themselves. And I think when you take those three things together, um, they, they make up a pretty good image of some of the, the characteristics that I personally prize really highly um, in entrepreneurs that, that, that we meet. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, and I just noticed amongst all your answers, one thing I've just I, I've noticed that was resonating was each person was a generalist, and they're willing to learn and to adapt and to learn new things. When you guys were in your early stages, especially just even finding a partner, was trust not a factor? Was trust not something that, like in, in, in our case, we kind of experienced it before that? Actually, more than one person. The trust just burnt apart before we even started anything, before we even materialized anything, before we even had an idea that that was actually concrete. Have you none of you guys experienced this as you guys are familiar? so far? This is this such you guys experience? I would say, uh, in my opinion, you're right. Trust is a factor, because trust is more of a hit or a miss. And uh, the reason I say it for that is when we started out, everyone that was a co-founder initially we're all best friends in our university days. So you know, it was people you know, you know, you've done student government stuff, where you've done parties with. So you had that, you knew how they could execute. But then we, this is a business that was more of a different animal. And only of the four of us that started, only three of us walked out. One person asked me, just because 
they couldn't deliver to us in that way. So trust, it's essential in terms of when you start building the team, expand and being able to trust and know if your co-founder makes a decision while you weren't there, that it's the right decision. That comes with time of working within the business, whereas at the beginning, it's a new environment. You, you two, if you're probably building with friends, you just transition it from your know, friends and the social life into more of a business aspect. So. Trust is, uh, is fundamental to, uh, to everything that we, that, that we do, every business I've ever been a part of. Uh, I've always had, had co-founders, and it's, you know, there are people that I've, that I've always felt that, you know, I can go to battle with in terms of, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're a company here that's going to be trying to change or make a dramatic impact. And you're going to get a lot of pushback from uh, when you start to have success, um, and so it's like, you know, can we can we go through and build a billion dollar company with these people? It's tough to tell at the very beginning, but if you, it, and it really is like, like, you know, a shared passion and and really getting a, a good understanding through, uh, like I met my co-founder Pete um, at, a, at a networking event like this, and we had a very similar idea in terms of what we thought that the way a business should be run and that, and that how to grow a business from, from the, like, most important people are actually the, the, the people on the team and how to be able to grow through culture and uh, and by creating a disruptive company by having just a bunch of really exceptional people and just it, being able to connect and, and really, it's, it's tough but it was instinctual. I mean, then literally the next day I was supposed to be going and pitching for, for a business that I was part of for uh, for uh, a fairly large uh, you know, seed funding around. So it's like, I decided that this was fantastic. We had a shared vision. We really trusted each other in terms of just for, from that component, and just you know, acted on and got on that one. But trust is fundamental. Yeah, the only thing I meant to that is that, like, it's, it's obviously a very important thing, and it certainly should be prioritized. There's a way they, that they there's a reason that the way they talk about founding teams is that you know a best friend means smarter than you. Are. I call this the West Ring rule of co-founders. You know, if you have a best friend and he's smarter than you are, that's your sort of chief of staff or your co-founder. And I would say that because of how difficult this is, if you build your team the right way, there's almost nothing you can't overcome. There's no challenge that is too great. I think that's where trust comes into it. So if you've got a co-founder that you trust, they're the right kind of person for the job and you've got a, a massive challenge, even if it's another member of the team, I don't see there being a way that those kinds of challenges get you. Michael, how are we doing on time? Um, we're good for time. I mean, the only thing left now is kind of flip it over to the live stream. But I mean, if you guys are enjoying the panel, you have some more questions, I'm, I'm happy to keep you guys up there for a little longer. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm sure there's a burning question over there. So. Yeah. <laughs> Questions from Michael from Bay Street Labs. Um, I see a lot of demand for fintech in Toronto, um, but I also see a lot of banks now getting into space and partnering with startups. Um, and we've seen Tekken Labs being a lab and not being able to, you know, they, they actually scratched their sort of lab and, and didn't want to work on creating products. So I was just wondering what is your value add um, and what, what do you bring to the table? What do you say to banks and other financial institutions when you want to? So, if, if you had your question right, it's about uh, what is our value add for building for banks. Um, our core product has always been built around empowering auditors, which are accounting firms. And so, we see, like, we're figuring out the technology now because what we've, what we've got is a way to be able to do some contract reconciliation that can be applied to loans, be applied to insurance, things like that, but it also speeds up uh, the process for, uh, for uh, completing an audit. And so um, when assessing the different opportunities with it, it's like, it, you know, for banks, we see a lot of value for uh, loan applications um, it, to be able to, uh, to look Kind of get um, like banks deal with a lot of um, uh, big, big companies deal with banks for a lot of like for vendors things like that. So what you can do is you can sort of vendor agreements and things like that, and you can go through and process uh, uh, process actual loans by automating the process through uh, through the, their own you know financial statements with 
on the commercial banking side, but on the small to mid-sized banking side, um, we're still kind of looking at, at those opportunities because it came it came to us and it caught us completely by surprise. And that was only that, that was about a month ago. So now we're looking at the new sort of opportunities. But, but that's kind of where, where we see it uh, right now. Does that answer your question? I was just wondering, um, are you looking to build standalone products or are you, you know, looking to just you know, like build on whatever they have and innovate on the solutions that, you know, that they have? And, and not just banks, I mean, just the financial institutions that you know, survive the credit crisis. Yeah, uh, it's, um, it, it once again goes exactly, we're, we're in a, a dilemma right now. Um, in terms of we have all these tools, but do we want do we want to be a tool company or do we want to be a platform company that can be enabled by other fantastic companies that are out there to and open up our uh, our SDKs to be able to have other tools better empower our uh, our solution? And so we're we're literally in the middle of, of looking at that right now and, and assessing the opportunities for it because once we once we perfect this model for um, either whether it's for banks or whether it's for uh, whether it's for you know, accounting firms or even um, like uh, like venture capitalists, things like that. They can all, the legal industry, like it's all like there's so many different applications that can be used for. It. So what's the what's the do we go with the tool route or do we go with the platform play and use uh, and use distribution and uh, and build up our distribution channel to be able to make it be kind of uh, a much more powerful uh, and compelling reason for uh, for other fantastic venture companies. You know, from Toronto or anywhere else, to be able to be uh, to be part of uh, our vision. Just a question around uh, funding. Uh, obviously, every business is trying to make that runway as long as possible. So you can say we find a lot of something that's why. Uh, can you guys talk about type of funding, uh, amount of funding, and also how much control you are usually comfortable giving up, and just sort of your experiences around that. I don't know about the other two, but I would say that every experience that I've had talking to another co-founder about this has been that you're going to bleed um, at the very beginning of your business. Sometimes it's from personal savings, sometimes it's from family and friends, but there's going to be a cost at the beginning to getting it to a point where you feel like you really have made a lot of lasting impact in terms of the product that you can put out and that you can raise funding on the back end. So at the very beginning, you're going to front load some costs. We found that we were able out of our early rounds, which was an FFF round, that we were able to gain enough track, uh, enough capital there to do what we needed to do most importantly, which was identify what re the most valuable thing is in our space. And that was really the core of it. That's the thing that we needed to do the most. Um, the trick after that is making sure that the process for doing that doesn't take so long that you run out of the ability to keep financing it before you actually get to the destination. And I think that tons of startups get fall fall by that. I think that's an incredibly difficult challenge in the startup world. And maybe it's supposed to be that way. Maybe that's a way of cutting the wheat from the chaff. And maybe it's not. Um, we're coming to a point where we're going to be raising sometime in the new year, where it'll be our first institutional investment. And it's going to be of a size that we hope will be substantial enough to take us for about a year and a half's worth of runway. But I think that the first burden, and I'm sure you back me up on this, the first burden of getting product market fit is on the founders. You've got to be able to sort that out yourselves or with your family and friends. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in terms of funding uh, for us, uh, we've been around for about two years now and we've gotten 100% uh, bootstrap. You know, funded from our own personal savings as well as uh, family and friends. And initially we tried raising funding where, as Jonathan said, you know, the first focus was finding that product market fit. And in the process of doing that, we realized our cost, it will cost that we could actually figure out other ways of achieving those costs. And that's sort of the blessing in disguise when you're operating in a place like Toronto, where people would normally think you know, funding is not as accessible as maybe San Francisco or Silicon Valley, in the sense that when you have to make those tight budget decisions, you get more resourceful. And it's, you know, I normally, when I speak to co-founders that would come here, I'm looking to start this business, I kind of love try and get your own funds, try and figure out other ways to do things that you might need money for. So by the time you get to a stadium, maybe a year or two, you either know if you have a good product and a good business, as well as the fact that now you know lots of resources that you can even maximize on a larger basis in the future. In terms of where we are for funding going forward, 
just like with the same process as CAC, where we'll be looking to raise new funds in the new year, so the first quarter of 2016, somewhere in maybe the middle seven figures to eight figures, something that can last us for the next uh, year and a half uh, as we tend to uh, expand our market uh, segments. Um, there, there's only so uh, that, there's only so much I can I can go into detail about uh, about our funding, but uh, we we got funding from Deloitte, and so that uh, that was uh, that, that was a blessing because um, it gives us the opportunity to have a very great distribution channel and to be able to help form our uh, our uh, you know our our product and how it would fit within the marketplace and such. Um, Generally speaking, about funding, I've always been a bootstrap guy myself, and so I the mindset's always been if you have a great idea and and you can uh, uh, you know and you can go like if you had if you have a great idea and you put it in the marketplace and like and you can, you build a product around that I, I find that uh, that money will always follow. You chase the money and you chase the funding and you don't you don't chase the market opportunities and just running as fast as you can and, and being resourceful um, with, with what you have. It makes it very difficult to, uh, um, it, you just lose, lose sight and lose focus. And so I, I've always been, uh, like there's a lot of value in having, in having uh, a venture capital funding or, uh, or, or any other types, but only when it's strategic to actually help you get you to, to, to where you're going. It, like, I just find that uh, that you know, if you get too much funding, it, it all it really just cuts down on on the there's just a lot of wastage. And so when you when you are strapped for cash, you have to make quick and very effective decisions with every with every little bit, and, and it drives that hunger and, and that push to be moving forward. And the longer that you can hold on to your equity as, as long as you possibly can, it actually allows uh, allows you to have uh, be in a much stronger position when you do go. Um, and you have that market traction. You do have VCs following you, um, and, uh, and and that are looking looking to invest. So you just have a little bit more of a pie. We saw that uh, more stay under control. You have up in that case. You are already in good place. You might not need to give up as much of your company. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd actually love your uh, your you know. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing that I'll start by saying is. is uh, that's really important that I don't think a lot of founders, especially in the technology space, are, are thinking about today is sort of questioning whether you're a venture-backable business or not, right? Most of the businesses that have ever been built in the world were not built by, or backed by venture capital, right? And there's a bit of a default these days where I'm seeing every single person that wants to start a business, they want to raise money from VCs, um, and, and you don't have to, right? Like, you can build an amazing business without VCs. Um, now, you can also build an amazing business with VCs. Typically, when you go raise venture capital, that's because you have a fairly, um, you know, cash flow, you know, sort of cash efficient business that has some really high potential upside, um, that, you know, has a, a, an aspect of sort of like speed involved where, you know, being able to gain a large part of that market really quickly is a discernible massive advantage. Um, and, uh, and, and VCs are really excited to back that kind of stuff. But there's so many types of businesses that don't require venture capital. I think um, you know, that's the first thing that I'd urge any, any founder to, to think about. It's actually, do we need to raise money in the first place or are we looking at the type of company um, that is venture backable? Um, because it's otherwise a bit of a waste of time um, to you know, spend all of that energy uh, trying to raise money uh, when you have something that inherently you know, doesn't have many odds of raising. Um, so, so that's one. Um, you, know, you can build an amazing business without VCs and, and never doubt that. Uh, it, it's just you, know, you need to commit to that from the beginning. Um, and then number two, uh, relating, you know, part of your question was about like, how much equity do you need to give up, et cetera. Um, what does that look like? Really, there, there's no simple answer there. Um, the reality uh, is that it depends entirely on your success. Um, and you know, the more successful you are, the more leverage you have, um, and you know, the more the VC wants to be part of your company as well. Um, and, and that's just sort of natural supply and demand, right? Uh, you know, when I'd, I'd encourage everybody to look at fundraising as a sales process, because that's really all it is. You are selling a piece of a company, of your company, to other people that want or don't want that thing. 
and they have limited cash. And they need to deploy that cash on the thing that they think will make them the best returns of the long term. Right? And, and they either really want that and are willing to pay a high price for it, or they don't want it all that much and they're not willing to pay a price for it at all. Right? Um, and so the more successful you become, the more metrics you have to prove or that you have to back up your position, um, you know, the, the, the better the product, the more defined the market, um, the more you know, visionary, uh, the, the stronger the technology, all of that stuff. Um, the more likely it is, on average, um, that you'll have investors that are willing to fork out money for that. Um, but I am seeing a lot of people that these days are, are trying to raise really, really early. Um, and it's not to their advantage um, all the time. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to add, add one thing in, um, about all that. One, one, of the, um, one of my mentors from, uh, from back in Ottawa, uh, Terry Matthews, uh, when I was just starting to be an, be an entrepreneur, he uh, he told me that uh, that you know if you want to if you want to go and, and raise money, whatever it is, um, that's fine. But better than going and raising money, why don't you go to a customer with these feature sets and say, hey, would you buy this? And if they say yes, try to close a deal on it and have that as a way to really actually start uh, start rolling rolling up the, the actual product itself. So any, any entrepreneur that's out there that is just starting out and they're thinking that they need all of this money and all this capital. You, you know, there are great government programs and great, great, you know, great uh, ways to get a little bit of capital going, but then actually, you know, just going and, and going to a customer and actually just saying, hey, would you buy this? And and trying to get somebody that's willing to, uh, to take a punt on, on um, you know, an idea and, and, and as a vision. Just you sort out the details, but you can, you can do that. Um, I just wanted to add that piece to it. Of course. Um, are there any other questions that you guys have that you'd like to answer tonight? No? Cool. Okay. One last one. I have seen a number of very successful uh, one-person business just putting videos on YouTube. Any comments on it? What is the perception or any numbers, the statistics of who who fails and who succeeds when they just go to YouTube and have a lot of people following them? Um, yeah, I mean, good question. As I was saying earlier, I, I you know, personally, I don't see that as a very venture backable business, right? It, it's sort of a, a one man show of somebody doing something that's not super scalable necessarily, videos and putting it out there. Um, and, and there's definitely many people that have succeeded in making a lot of revenue with that and becoming personally, you know, really successful and, and really acclaimed. Um, but it's not necessarily something that venture capitalists invest in. Um, and so. I think you know that doesn't discredit it at all to my point earlier. Um, if you believe that you have the opportunity as an individual to share your knowledge or your insight or your perspective or your art or your work with the rest of the world in a way that inspires them um, and that they're willing to pay you either with their time, attention, or cash, um, typically you'll do fairly good for yourself. Um, because them spending time with you probably means that you're making cash indirectly via ads or them spending dollars with you means you're making cash directly. Um, and so I think there's there's always a really great opportunity uh, for more people to do you know uh, single person businesses. Um, and you should never you should never doubt uh, your ability to do that. Um, I haven't seen many contexts in which uh, you know a single person sort of that is creating videos uh, or. Um, you know, art or something like that on channels like YouTube or, or, or other um, have been backed sort of by investors uh, it, for a piece of the company. Uh, that doesn't happen often, um, but you know, typically they, they don't necessarily need investors because they're they're doing fairly well when they're really able to to figure out the way to attract enough uh, attention. Um, market. Uh, sorry, just to add to that, uh, I also think the part of market fit analysis helps the one man that business in the same way it could help maybe a 25 person startup in the sense that I have a friend, uh, she does the videos online for some 
a private fashion line that you know, she creates herself for people. And what I've kind of noticed is, obviously, the scalability might not be, the path to scalability might not be as clear as you'd have for maybe a tech startup company, but then it still follows the same ideas in the product market fit. When she started her videos, there seemed to be people who were really looking for something like this, and she sort of builds followers along the way. And I feel that's the same thing that makes it similar to a 10-person company or a 50-person company, in the sense that even when you're a one-man business, you have to find that perfect market to kind of fit, and once you find that, you can scale, you can have as much success as possible. In terms of scaling, scaling becomes difficult because at some point you might need to, you know, if you're doing the videos, bring them for more sophisticated producers to release those videos, or even whatever product you're advertising through the videos, or whatever service you're offering, you might need more people to be able to cater to the customers you're hopefully getting from those videos. So that's just that. Cool. All right. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're all good here for the panel, gentlemen. Give uh, give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about the, uh, the product <laughs> landscape here in Toronto and sort of, sort of the outlook for, for Toronto as well and get all these lovely gentlemen's opinion. Um, from your left to right, we've got managing editor, our editor-in-chief for Beta Kit, uh, Douglas Soltis. I hope I pronounced your last name right. Yeah, you nailed it. Awesome. That rest of feels. <laughs> Perfect. The two things I get right all the time. Um, next thing we've got very Jonathan. wide skill set. <laughs> <laughs> Jack of all trades, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Vega from Golden Venture Partners next to him, and then we've got Alex Lynn who's been here for pretty much the last five hours um, <laughs> running events for us. Awesome, thanks so much, Alex. Pleasure. And then on the end, uh, Brian Watson here, he's good at basketball and being a wall uh, right here, so. Basketball? Uh, yeah. I can jump. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> not, not <laughs> right on. Yeah. So I'll let these guys take it away and just get into some good discussion. Okay, so um, I'm super excited about the subject. I'm not a native Torontonian. I've been here for about five years. Uh, I actually came to Toronto uh, working for uh, a major, or like the only major tech company at the time, uh, Blackberry. So my experience in this city um, from a, a product standpoint was one of experiencing a city that had a bunch of digital native shops solely dedicated towards servicing the, the Canadian versions of large brands that exist in Toronto. Where the money is. Um, so, from from my my experience, I've, I've always seen kind of Toronto that way from a product standpoint. I would think that what's changed in the last five years is that the the startup mindset has kind of caught hold in, in the city as well as the rest of the country. Um, I'm just wondering, as we look at say comparing Toronto to uh, not only the other, the rest of the world but other places in Canada, do you guys, when you're looking at Toronto as a uh, as, a, as a place for product, do you feel that it has an identity, or how do you just see the city or describing it to an outsider? I mean, I think in a lot of ways you you hit you hit the nail on the head. It's always been an agency based in the city. You know, you have endless ad agencies, you have endless professional services, you have endless people trying to do shred credits on. Just very simplistic kind of, or not simplistic, but very agency model. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Shred credits for mobile games for massive retail chains because they want uh, a customer engagement experience. For you. Yeah, exactly. Now, what you're seeing in the last few years is you're starting to see Toronto build up a, a real startup culture, right? But I don't think we've actually found what that identity is. I mean, I'm seeing very regularly I'm seeing ad agencies or ex-ad agencies who have productized and have tried to now build something like they've seen what they've been offering and they're now trying to just build a product out of it, sell it as a software as a service um, platform. So, so you're starting to see that. You're seeing a little bit of hardware. You're seeing a little bit of like B2C plays. But it's, I don't think that we have quite a, I don't think we quite have the answer yet. And I think that the biggest thing we're missing are those big anchor tenants, you know? When BlackBerry was around, you understood what Canada was about, or at least what Waterloo was about. Yeah. In Toronto, we don't really have that massive player. You have Shopify, we have, say, like... Shopify's an Ottawa company. Yeah, they kind of moved here. <laughs> no, I'm taking it from Shopify. Fair enough. Okay. Um, we've got, like, Wattpad, we've got FreshBooks. We've got a few different players in, like, these different fields, and I think as you start seeing them grow and explode, at that point, you're going to see Canada develop, or, or sorry, Toronto, develop a 
a real kind of personality okay. around well, those. I, I, think you're, I think you're right, and then maybe to follow up on that, not only do I feel like we have a, a Toronto drone kind of anchor uh, tenant for the city, but we've also seen some of those, those types of companies that you've mentioned. So like TN and Lax earlier this year, uh, you know, they helped build Medium, just everything that they built was at least cool, if not amazing. Uh, shut down to go work and fix Facebook. Uh, in an article that we did on Betakit, we uh, interviewed John Lax and he talked about like, you know, the successor to that kind of like design agency component in Toronto, all these great companies. He mentioned companies like Heist, e Notions, and Loop. Since that time, uh, Heist has shut down. Uh, B Notions was acquired by Sibelius Solutions, and Loop was acquired by, uh, I think, DMAC Media. So what does that say about Toronto, where not only do we not have that kind of, you know, that, that signifier of what it means to build a product in the city, but the, the ones that we had that were walking the line of the agency model are, are, are gone or acquired. And maybe I'll, I'll put this to, to Brian. Well, I think you've got, you've got two paths. I, I, I don't think it's quite hollowing out in the middle, but you've got some that are flipping into so and so and loop, uh, uh, flipping into DMAC. Now you've got that path, but you also have the other path where groups like Limelight Platform uh, came out of an agency and are now making an end-to-end -end product and, and, and productizing it. So you do have a little bit of a hollowing out of uh, what was a really big center of service-oriented uh, companies, and they're now starting to see that there is there, there is life after just pure service. We can't scale, and there's too many people trying to scale with too few uh, too few companies to back it. So we've got a good product, we've got a specialization. Let's move into that, or let's go in and let's take our skills and, and really leverage those into uh, some other uh, larger organizations. So I think you're you're starting to see what what was a very lumpy landscape uh, with one lump in the middle uh, of sort of service-based entrepreneurial companies moving towards a large co, you know, service co, and then product co, it's not scaling out of that. Yeah, you, you can see that with like B Notions as well, where the, yeah. one of the, the CEO or the co-founder went and started up Gallup Labs. You know, like this is starting to become a pattern, or out of here we have um, Sampler, which was originally an ad agency, or was working a lot as an ad agent, and ended up creating this really awesome productized version. Okay. So, then let's let's do the comparison point to because I, I know I, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a problem for the city of Toronto that it doesn't have like the Drake of food product yet. Um, although if Drake gets in the product, that would be <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, <gosh, laughs> for that Alex drop, yeah. Um, but you know, Alex, you, you spent a lot of time in in Montreal, and I, I guess one of the comparisons I'm wondering is like I think of all the cities in Canada, I think the only one that really has an identity when it comes to what they're building can be Kitchen Waterloo. I think of hardware and I think of engineers, although we have some of that here. Like, just going across kind of like the four major cities in Canada, what's that? Do, does any other city have? Frankly, I don't think Canada has an identity yet from a technology standpoint. Neither, none of the cities specifically have a sub identity either. Um, I don't think that's necessarily bad, right? These things take time. Uh, if you look at the valley, um, everybody's like, oh, they do really well at consumer software and mobile and all that kind of stuff. Um, we also need to remember that they've been in the game for about 60 to 70 years now. Like, computing was literally invented there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think that enables them to tell their story in a fundamentally different way from a place like Montreal that got its first early stage venture fund when, you know, real venture is back then, Montreal startup popped up in 2007 or 2006. Um, and so it's been less than 10 years that a place like Montreal has had sort of early stage venture capital funding. Similarly in Toronto, there hasn't been a, that wide a distribution of early stage capital either. Um, Vancouver, similar things. Um, and those are really the, the sort of three largest ones after that. Kitchener Waterloo uh, obviously developed a lot of credibility in the last years because of Blackberry. Um, the takeout Blackberry in that, that place was never really a thing. Um, before that, from a from a product development uh, standpoint, as, as a former Blackberry Blackberry employee, I can attest to the fact that prior to the death of Blackberry, there was nothing in the city other than Blackberry. Right. Yeah. It required, it required it's essentially good. a forest fire yeah. to create the growth for these new companies. And, yeah. and you know, you know, I think that's a really interesting point, and, it, and it's slightly tangential, but. Um, it's something that I say often, everybody's always trying to crack what makes the valley the valley and why we aren't the valley. 
Um, and I have a really simple answer to that, and it's Fairchild Semiconductor. Um, you know, Fairchild Semiconductor was the world's first trillion dollar company. Um, pretty much everything that we know today in technology somehow came out of Fairchild. <coughs> Intel is a byproduct of one of the founders that left Fairchild, which means that all of the phones that you use and all of the computers are enabled by one of those founders. Uh, you know, then you have things like Greylock Capital um, that came out of that, that funded things like Apple, that once again we all use. And then because of that, you also have things like you know PayPal that happened, which led to Peter Thiel and the Founders Fund, which led to Facebook and etc. And so if you really look at what that ecosystem does really well, it, it sort of recycles its people and its capital really efficiently. Right? It's kind of like compost. It uses the depths or the past successes to fertilize great futures. Um, and if you look at Waterloo, I think the strongest thing that it has going for it right now is probably actually the death of BlackBerry because it's liberated a tremendous amount of really smart engineers, number one. And number two, there's been a lot of money that's flooded back into the ecosystem. Um, and, and you know, just the university is probably, you know, miles ahead of where it was 10 years ago from a uh, product and, and engineering standpoint because of large sums of capital that were that were spent there by the founders. Yeah, because for the you know for 10 years the only money that Jim and Mike put into the startup ecosystem was through the University of Waterloo. Exactly. So, so, then, so then taking into mind what you just said and what kind of pride said about what's happening in Toronto is a, kind of this stratification, this, this kind of cleaning out from the density. Are just from each of your personal personal perspective, are you seeing a trend towards grabbing onto an identity, something that's popping up? Like I know, you know, we Tom Emmerich, uh, senior editor of Betakit, the wearables guy in Canada, just ran a, a great uh, conference on wearables and entertainment and sports uh, last week. He never does those, so it's really hard to Yeah, do. he's. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's probably on his way to China right now to like moderate a 15 minute panel. Um, you know, he's he's identified a strong movement towards wearables and and the the maker component in Toronto, but it's it's, it's burgeoning. And I'm wondering, are you guys seeing any kind of like signs of life of identity or other things going on? Like, what are you tracking? I see a lot of different signs of life in a lot of different places, and so I do see the wearables. You've got Mimi, you've got uh, the, the, uh, oh, uh, the, the headbands, the uh, views. You've got a ton of different little ones like that, um, but you've also got a ton of marketing tech. You've got burgeoning fintech, and there's a lot of people trying to really push fintech, and fintech can be a Toronto cluster. I actually like the fact that there hasn't been um, I wouldn't mind having a few breakout companies, but I think having many different uh, uh, foci in the community makes it a lot more robust than saying you've got one uh, one anchor tenant in the community, and if that tenant goes down, the entire uh, ecosystem changes. We've got a really robust ecosystem of many different uh, uh, foci for, for startups. We say clean tech, we've got uh, clean tech IT, we've got the Internet of Things, uh, we've got you know, ad tech, fintech. Yeah, we have a really robust uh, group of companies. It also means we can get developers and things like that for the you know, sort of more niche uh, specific type uh, opportunities. So there's, not, there's not burnout or overcompetition, exactly. inflation of you know salary type of talent yep. because. Uh, but, but, but are you guys at that point? Or? Well, yeah, I, I think you know it's sort of what I was alluding to earlier when I said I don't know if Canada has an identity or that any city in it has an identity. We're seeing a lot of everything, and, and yeah, there is. You know, to Tom's point. Uh, a sort of growth in early stage hardware companies, specifically wearables in Toronto. But I could make that case about you know Montreal with Ohm Signal and you know um, it's some other companies coming out from from there as well. Um, you know, I guess sort of somewhat rhetorically, the question back is: um, Do cities need an identity? Does that actually matter? Right? You're not um, allowed to ask for. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 a, it's a fair point because no one would say that the valley has an identity or um, you know even something like Boston has an identity. Right. So you know, Boston does have an identity. Yeah. Like biotech is Boston. You go to Boston, you want biotech, you go to Boston. And I, I would actually disagree with you guys. I think we, I, I think we're starting to see some identity, and I think it's going to be around what Toronto's always been strong at. That would be fintech. So you're seeing a ton in the Bitcoin space in Toronto, which is very strange that we're like yeah. somehow. <laughs> running Bitcoin all over North America. You see you see a ton of it, it doesn't make, I mean it's strange, but at the same time we have this enormously powerful FinTech industry, um, all the banks here, and you're seeing it with ad agencies. So I think you're seeing a lot of MarTech, a lot of marketing and ad technology come out, because again, that's what we've been good at. 
that's what we're going to continue to be good at. Um, so so I, I think you do see the beginnings of identity. I don't, I don't think we're going to be a wearable um, headquarters, no offense to Tom intended, I don't think we'll be the IoT guys, I don't think we'll be hardware, and quite frankly, I don't see where we have any competitive advantages or any uh, heads, like any head start on these versus any other city. But is, it, is the diversity an advantage? Is that I don't think it's an, no, I don't actually think it is. I think there's an issue with diversity, and I think we go back to the fact that we just Tweet don't that. have. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, for the text, for context. <laughs> to make sure the sign lights up. 140 characters. <laughs> 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 Hashtag, he's drunk. <laughs> I, I don't think that, sorry, what was the... Diversity is an advantage? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that diversity in and of itself is an advantage. I think that, quite frankly, the opposite is true. I think it's when you start figuring out what your identity is and you have top people with top skill sets who can do it and then leave a company and do it again and leave that company and do it again. Like Alex was saying, recycling talent, recycling capital. That's what we need to be doing. And I think as soon as we start seeing it, It'll, it'll be interesting. I think, again, you need those anchor tenants, and we don't have them. Okay. So we don't have, and this was not uh, on the list of softball questions that I sent you guys earlier, <laughs> but we don't have a list of kind of anchor tenants, but we do have uh, probably a greater institutional infrastructure than any other city in Canada when it comes to places like, uh, well, first of all, all the accelerators, all the incubators, uh, the VCs, uh, things like Mars, universities. Um, whereas, you know, even comparable to Kitchener Waterloo, there's, there's literally one place you have to go in that city, and that's the tannery, because Community Tech's there, and Velocity's there. So you get the, you get the university, and you get everything else. Um, is, does, is that in any way shaping or defining the identity of Toronto and what's coming out of it? Just the fact that there seems to be a lot of opportunities for young, you know, we're in the DMZ right now, for, for people to come and, and build a product or learn how to make a company or just, you know, go to startup school. I don't know that it shapes the identity as much as it shapes the capabilities, right? And I, I think that's the more important point. It's I don't, I don't actually think that identity matters all that much, right? And that was sort of my rhetorical point earlier, which is that if you actually look at most of the cities globally that are outputting companies, most of those cities don't have a discernible identity, and that's totally fine, right? Okay. Um, well, beyond that, and just just the landscape itself is it is it affecting? The, you're sorry about capabilities yeah. that come up. Exactly, and I think from, from that standpoint, Toronto is really interesting these days because it has a lot of universities that are training better engineers and you know more rounded skill sets than ever before. It has a lot more co-working place and spaces, a lot more just general accessibility to cheap real estate for people to work from and start things in. Uh, it has a lot sort of better readily available capital at the earliest of stages, right? Funds like Golden VP, John works for, and that weren't around a handful of years ago. Um, and, you know, myself at Highline, you know, and, and the grant, we came out of the merger of extreme startups, but if you look at that entire story, it's, it's you know, not even a decade old as well. Um, and I think all of those are increasing our capabilities as a city, but also the results that we're seeing from our founders, and I think that matters a lot. But I think I'd add that one of the issues that I find with Toronto is that you've got these different pools and they're not connected. They don't communicate. You know, so so you've got these disparate pools. Mars is its own little island, and then you've got DMZ as its own little island, and you've got kind of all of these little like shops that are trying to do various things, and no one's really communicating. One of the beauties of Waterloo, I think why Waterloo is as successful as Waterloo is, is that there's one spot. There's literally one coffee shop that everyone yeah. can't not run into everyone yeah. else. Everyone's there and you're going to bump into the right people, you're going to bump into other people who have gone through the same things you are. There's no kind of splitting of it. Yeah. Can I ask an odd question about that? Sure. You're essentially talking about that from the perspective of a founder, right? Where they're gonna bump into all these great resources. Yeah. I'm a founder in this city. You know, we've got great contacts here at DMC. We're at Mars. We're down at, uh, you know, talking to folks at Creative Destruction Labs. We're out in Communitech. We're all over the place. Good. Why are we bumping into, like, why don't you think that we're bumping into people in the same way you are in KW? Because we I'm all ran you. over here from the CIX conference at Mars to make sure right. we were here. Right. Because yeah. you have to. Can't be everywhere at once you get to choose. Yeah, the difference is if you're at KW, you're at Balzac's all the time, or you're in like the foundry or the tannery, and that 
right. here. Right. So you're Whereas here, you're, you're either here or at Mars or there or there or there yeah. or at like. Because the Which conversation I had with the folks at Community Tech was essentially that, you know, we've got all of these resources. You can go and pick and choose your favorites, but I guess you're saying that you shouldn't have to. You should just have everything all in a Well, sorry, is it, we have to, I think when we're talking about the landscapes here, the, none of this is being done with intention. This is entirely yeah. organic. Yeah, like, it's, it's, there was nothing in Kitchener-Waterloo. Like, the reason why the, the tannery exists is because it was the one building on the cheap side <laughs> in Kitchener, not Kitchener. in Waterloo. Yeah. Yeah. So where the real estate was cheap because all the Blackbird employees had bought up all the real estate in, on the good side of the city. Right. So that they could build, that they had cheap like industrial places like we, what we see in kind of Parkdale and Liberty Village. And then you had to have the biggest Canadian tech company ever die dramatically. Like that wasn't planned. But it was an opportunity that was, uh, I think, is being capitalized upon now. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you like a personal little example of like just pure serendipity. I was at Balzac in KW. I had just met with a company as this person was Which leaving. Uh, I can't remember. It's just some company. As this person, <laughs> I mean, the water company. It's <laughs> hard to like softball, yeah, softball. <laughs> So, so I just went with the company. As this person's leaving, he introduces me to one of his friends who had just come in to get a coffee. We start chatting. Three months later, or five months later, I've invested, like we're investors in this company, you know? And it was just because we were at the right place at the right time. Would I have met him otherwise? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, I, I don't know of another place where that happened, or I don't know of a place where that happens in Toronto. I can go to like, you know, I'm in King West. I hang out a lot at well, Jimmy's. Oh, yeah, to, no, to that, to that point where, like, when I go down to Kitchener, what do you do? More drunk. To that to that point, when I'm in Kitchener Waterloo, I don't I don't book meetings. Right. And I'm gonna show up the place and I'm gonna maybe run, I'm gonna run into the people that I can see. I don't have to have a meeting schedule with them. Yeah, it's in, in Toronto every day I'm making sure I'm on the right side of the city or I'm coordinating because getting from uh, you know uh, High Line at Queen of Bathurst, making sure that uh, I can get to my meeting at round 13 in Leslieville on time is like a major scenario, especially right. when it gets dark at 4 o'clock and it's super cold. <laughs> so so we, the solution, by the way, is buy a motorcycle. Uh, that's the only way that I've been able to get around the city fast enough to be able to make it from all these different things. That answer is false. Yeah. Um, okay, so no, so we, we, we're, we're now 20 minutes in. Uh, I think you've been all very articulate about uh, your thoughts on th this panel. Uh, but you know, here we have represented uh, VC money, uh, pre-seed accelerator investment, and then representative from like the incubation process in general in, in Toronto. For uh, especially considering you know where this panel is being housed today, um, why should anyone in the audience be listening to your thoughts on product in Toronto rather than say uh, Rob Lay from Tiny Hearts or Huda from Well Simple who build beautiful product every day? Right? What's your argument for them agreeing with everything you're saying? I'll, I'll throw two up. Once I think it's a false dichotomy. I don't think it's either or. I think listen to both. I think we generally agree. I, I, I can't imagine that we'd be hugely in disagreement on what matters in the product. Two, we, we have capital. You should probably listen to us if you want funding. I mean, you don't have to listen to us. You I mean, probably should. It's called the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. Um, and the rules. But, yeah, I mean, it, you know, John has a point there in that at the end of the day, whether we sort of like it or not, um, and this is something that I personally think about, um, investors do, in some respect, have a lot of control um, over the type of future that the rest of us get to live. Right, because of that, they sort of make the calls and, and take the shots on the things that get funding and the things that don't. Um, and as founders, uh, when you're building a product and optimizing for fundraising, um, sometimes, I'm sure, you've been in situations where you've probably taken a decision uh, because you thought that would dis decision would probably look better in front of those people, but it wasn't necessarily maybe what you intended to do in the first place. Um, that's not right or wrong, it's just for better or worse, the nature of a world with limited capital uh, and, and, and such a high demand for it, um, where, yeah, the people that have the capital are also setting the rules on how it's deployed, uh, and those rules 
largely stem from the fact that they have a job too, which is not philanthropy, it's to create returns for their own investors, and at any given time, they're judging you relative to all other opportunities on the table, saying, is this likely to make me some kind of returns? Um, and so, yeah, I think from that standpoint, um, there's, there's a strong case to be made that if you care a lot about raising money, you should probably, at minimum, be open to hearing the things that the investors in aggregate, and I say that you know, pretty importantly because investors can can disagree on things, but in aggregate, sort of the 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 average of what they're saying. Um, All right, so you defeated my straw man, okay. uh, and we've established that you guys set the rules. So let's but talk about. One, I, I don't even. I, I'd actually like to say one other thing or two other things. <laughs> One, off the bat, like, I, I do think this is a really strong straw. I mean, at our fund, you know, Amit is one of the partners. This guy built a product that he sold to Zynga, and then he ran Zynga's Toronto office, took it from a bottom performer to a top performer. You want to talk product? That guy knows product better than anyone I've ever met. So, I mean, I, I don't really see the, 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 the difference here. The other thing is, and, and just from a purely, whether you're raising money, whether you're just looking at starting your company, whether you're building your company, uh, yeah. How many companies have the people on this panel seen over the last year? That too. I mean, just the sheer volume of business models, apps, different takes on different markets, the way that people have tried to, to attack different markets, the, the sheer volume of types of companies. We've probably seen, I, I, I don't know, I mean, if you had to I guess can tell you, I can tell you because I track it. Yep. I've seen since last October or October a year ago. Yep. I have seen close to a thousand and thirty companies. Yep. Any any sense on it's that? A lot. It's like twenty a week. Probably see I, I've seen personally less than that. Yep. But as a you know as a fund, we've seen definitely in the ballpark, if not above that. Um, I've in the last year, I've probably seen somewhere in the two fifty to three hundred mark uh, companies. Yep. yep. Yeah, same well, sort of thing. Yeah. every every email I have an answer yes yeah, right yeah, exactly. um, and to, to the point like you know Alex and I've been spending our time uh, in the startup next program once a week yeah. kind of give, doing some mentorship uh, with companies trying to get themselves ready for an acceleration program and I don't know a thing about half their businesses mm -hmm. or what will make them successful in the market but I do know storytelling and I can give them some feedback on you know if they're getting across why their company is important or not but so I want you know I think the point on uh, your perspective and the, the conditions that create um, a situation where startups are looking to listen to your perspective if they want that funding. So I, I want I want to go through some of that. Like as sure. you guys are meeting these yeah. these startups as you're going through, you know what are you looking for? What what is standing out? Because we can talk about the actual like uh, does a, is a hot ship product is something beautiful, uh, elegant? Does that stand out more than the team behind it? The the founders like what's What's your marker? So I, so I know uh, there was a stat that I used to quote all the time when I was running the, the Angel organization, um, and it was a Morgenthaler uh, Ventures stat. Uh, they surveyed 200 of their failures, which you know is interesting, uh, 200 or so, uh, interesting, but they had enough failures to actually make it statistically <laughs> significant, but they found three failure modes. The first was technology. You know, they, the technology didn't work. It was 10% um, of the failures were just, you plugged it in and it blew up in your face. 30% was the market. It was some weird nanotechnology that nobody could really figure out how to commercialize. It was a material, I don't know, 3M didn't want it, I don't know what to do with it. The market didn't accept the technology. And 60% was the people couldn't deliver it, it was a team. It was so, so you know, they, you, and you'll hear this repeatedly you know, throughout the life of all, you know, going to panels like this, that people look for the people that are running the companies and you know, they're placing the bet on, you have to have the technology because that's an enabling factor to building your company. But what kills companies is people, and what grows companies is people. Um, so uh, I spent a lot of time getting to know the people, uh, watching them evolve from a place like TMZ into their own offices, raising a little bit of money, raising some angel money, getting to know the angels that have worked with them very closely for the last sort of six months, and uh, do they want to invest again? Do they want to kill them? You know, it, it, it matters, that personality. So that to me, it's, it's that team and having the technology to back up. I, mean, I think that's a great point, uh, and I'll layer onto it, and I'm, I'm sort of repeating myself from earlier here, but um, you know, what I had said is the thing that in my mind is probably the most important is the insight, the insight that that team brings to the table, right? Um, because at the end of the day, the reality is 
every single idea that you are bringing, we've likely seen before. It's insight right? into their space or how they're delivering it? Like both, both. Um, yeah, and, and I'll give a specific example. It, and, and it's just the reality, like we see so many ideas in aggregate that to some variation or some degree, we've seen things that are really, really similar. So the question becomes, if you're dedicating your time to that and we're investing in you as people, what makes your company unique relative to, in John's case, for example, all of the other hiring you know, applications that are out there, or you know, in Mike's case, relative to all of the other you know, FinTech technology that's out there. Um, and, and the case can go on and on and on. Um, and you know, to give a, a specific example of, um, so back at the last fund that I was at, Real Ventures in Montreal, and, and they recently opened in Toronto over the last year and a half, um, we invested in a company called Transit App. And Transit App is a mapping application to help you get around a city. Such a great app. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 you know, it's a really, they're doing phenomenally well in the App Store. They've been featured by Apple so many times. They have you know, a crazy amount of users. People love them. Um, and if you look at it back then, I mean, Google Maps was already out. Um, you know, there was a lot of other mapping technology out there. And so the question is, why invest in that, right? Um, it's been solved for already, was the argument. Um, and the answer was very simple, it was the insight. They realized that every single mapping technology out there, including Google, always kind of assumed that the people didn't know where they were going. The reality is most of all of us that are commuters that are in the city always know where we're going. We just need to know when to leave the house to hop on the bus to get there, right? And so that's a fundamentally different view of the problem set. And they redesigned the entire product from the ground up with that insight and that strategy. Just really saying, hey, this is a product that will let you figure out exactly when to leave your house and where to go and which lines are around you in real time. Um, it's an app, the first app that's made for commuters, right? And, and it's done remarkably well for them. And that's what I mean, right? Because if you look at it, at the surface level, it's just another application to get you around the city. But underneath, the way that the team is approaching the problem, the way that they're executing on the problem, brings a product out to the world that is remarkably different. And that, to me, is the difference between an investment and lack thereof. So John, I'll, I'll give you to kind of follow on, but I, I wanna maybe also lead it towards the ways that, you know, is it always 100% quantifiable that insight or is it just uh, sometimes like you know I, I look at things like Slack which is literally an IRC client or something that, you know I had tried five other versions of that service before but there's just something I just want to open up that app I want to be there there are you know sometimes it, it literally is the color choice it's the feeling that you get it's the experience of beyond the function. And I'm wondering like if, if you're if you're going to your uh, whatever internal process you have to kind of vet uh, an investment decision, do you guys have a language or a way to say, oh but it's it's like this plus fun or you know it's, it's really <laughs> not entirely no. And I and I get what you're saying. There is that intuitive feeling. I think everybody at the end of the day, you know, a lot of this is prediction, a lot of this is black magic. You don't you're trying to predict the future. Like, good luck, you'll be wrong more times than you're right, but the few times that you're right are gonna be the ones that matter at the end of the day. Um, I would say that the proxy that we almost always use, we're a little later than these guys, so we, we have the, the good fortune of having this proxy, is traction. You know, we, I don't need to know that like Slack makes me feel a certain way. I need to look and see that the users you've got, the first users you've got have crazy engagement levels. That the DAU of MAU is through the roof relative to other mobile apps relative to other kind of products in the same category. And that tells me kind of the same story. And then on top of that, if I have a good gut feeling about it, if the market looks big and if I love the team, then I'm there. But it's it's definitely a mixture of kind of the quant and the qualitative. Okay. So there there is a you may if you can't measure it directly, you can measure it in I, I will say that like <laughs> we have a I don't know if I should tell the story, but I've been drinking. Tweet it. Uh, <laughs> tell the story. There's, there's like an inside running joke with, with the team where if my boss, with Matt, if he can't fall asleep because of a deal that's keeping him up, kill it. Just kill it. Because it's, like, it's just his gut. And, but we trust his gut. He's got crazy good intuition. Up to now, he's had the most insane intuition. So, so the, the deal 
he, he can't figure it out. He, can't he doesn't know why, it. but like there's some sort of intuitive notion that something feels wrong to him about it. You know, and he can't like, and potentially like, and every single time that he's ignored that intuition, we've seen like the results. So it's like, we, we kind of trust it, even though we don't know why it works. And you, you know what? I mean, it's a fair point, because like, gut feeling are, is basically just knowledge that we can't put into words. It's years of our brain recognizing patterns. Literally, right? Like, our brain is trained to recognize patterns. And there is some stuff that we can't put into words, but have a really strong sense of. And that's what we define as gut feeling. But we're pretty, like, if there is one function that we are built to do as humans, because it's a biological evolutionary advantage, it's pattern recognition. That's why you, you know, forget names, but you'll never forget a face, right? You'll never kind of remember somebody's name, but forget their face. You'll remember their face, but forget their name. Why? Because we're really, really good with patterns, not that good with information. And I've been reminding myself of all your names this entire panel. Okay, so we have, I think, like 10 minutes left, and I want to throw up into QA, but everyone's sure. drinking, so I don't feel like the desperate need to close this thing there's, off. There's no pressure. So okay. Um, so I guess you know, just following following up on this, when you, you, the evaluation process, the gut feeling, the things, you, you know, from it, a, a golden edge perspective, you guys have a, a spe very specific thesis around mobile, and I know from like Highline's perspective, there's at least, uh, there has been like maybe some adoption. There was a time where like mobile was a specific thing you guys were looking at, yep. or maybe you had an opportunity to really uh, help us. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, when it when it comes to a thesis like that, how does that help? Does it help you? Does it help them? And you know, when, when we're talking about product now that lives on every device, it lives on the web, it lives in the cloud. Um, you know, how how a mobile app is like infrastructurally, you know, set up on the cloud can be more than whether the iOS client's good, right? Like, I, it, it, are those PCs still helpful, or how do they impact them? I, I think so, and I think what you're seeing is more specialization in venture capital. You know, when we say mobile, I mean, everything has a mobile component. It's kind of, like, to say, oh, you have a mobile app, therefore you are mobile, that's not really how we judge mobile. For us, mobile is, it's business structures and business models that are using the fact that everybody now has a little computer in their pockets to do something entirely different. So a great example um, is Joyce, you know, where they took a mobile kind of, they, they took this mobile phone and they gave it away for contractors to on the job estimate, um, give invoices, estimate, and get paid. Now something that back in the day, they'd have to go all the way back to their offices to send out an invoice, or to do an estimation, send out an invoice, hope to get paid, huge friction. They said, forget this, we're going to very easily do, like, let you do this in person immediately so that you don't have as much friction. And because of that, they got a ton of contractors locked in and now they opened up kind of the marketplace, which is non-mobile entirely. You know, so for us, like, it's not just, oh, you have a mobile app or a web, or like a web-friendly or mobile-friendly kind of application. That's, that's not mobile, you know? For us, mobile is fundamentally doing something different because you have a so mobile phone. So it's the wedge to traction? It's the way you get in the door? Yeah, it's, it's a way to do something that hasn't been doable before and a way to do something that like simplifies the process by 10 times versus where it used to be. You know, like imagine all of the people nowadays, I mean, for, for the longest time, we've been building software for people who white collar workers who sit in front of their computers. That's been the last, um, I'd say, forever. Yeah, 100 years, sure, let's go with that. That might be a little much, but close. Um, but in the so last- Since four personal computers actually became personal. Yeah, sure, 20. but in the last little while, I mean, I think something like 70% of workers are not white collar, they're blue collar, they're pink collar, they don't sit in front of the computer. So to ask them to go back to their computers to do all the things that they need to do is insane. We have another portfolio company, Brightwheel, which basically provides, um, daycare management software on tablet to, to, for, for daycare workers. You know, and the issue for daycare workers is they have to track everything because there's a ton of regulations in the U.S. around dealing with children. Yeah, obviously. And parents also yeah. are annoying. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but like up to now, they've had to like go and deal with a bunch of like hyperactive children and then run back to the computer, screw back to the computer to try to do this. So like a mobile option to do that makes it a hundred times better. Um, so that's kind of one big part of our thesis. And we've got two other kind of sub 